Mike Felicia, can we do a quick mic and video check, please? Yep, there's the mic. Can you hear me there? And oops. Video works. And see you and hear you. Thanks, Mike. Great. You're welcome. Thank you. Mic and video checks are complete. The board can start the meeting when they're ready. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. There we go. Okay. The time is one o'clock and I'd like to call to order the June 22nd, 2023 meeting of the Contractor State License Board. I'm Mary Teichert, CSLB's board chair. Most of our board members are here in person, but we have board member Jim Ruain and several CSLB staff who will be using cameras offsite. So thank you for getting that set up. Um, also, I'll mention for folks, when you speak, you have to push the button in the middle of the microphone. Uh, to mitigate any potential bandwidth issues, those participating offsite should consider keeping their camera off when not speaking. Any board member or staff offsite who'd like to comment during the meeting, please turn on your camera and select the raise your hand icon on the WebEx application. Our moderator will call upon you, at which point, please unmute yourself. Here, Diana Love, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it is indivisible with liberty and justice for all. I will now note for the record that Rodney Kobos and Steve Pinelli have approved absences for today. So Mariah, could you please confirm board member attendance and call the roll? Mariah. Mary Teichert. Here. Rodney Kobos approved absence. David De La Torre. Here. Miguel Galarza. Sorry, I don't. Amanda Gallo. Here. Alan Guy. Here. Susan Granzella. Here. Jacob Lopez. Here. Diana Love. Here. Michael Mark. Here. Steve Pinelli, approved absence. Jim Ruane. Here. Johnny Simpson. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you very much. So before we continue, I'm very pleased to introduce our newest board member, Amanda Gallo, who was appointed by the governor's office in March. So since 2018, Amanda has served as a management analyst for the Fremont City Manager's Office after four years at the Santa Clara County Housing Authority as senior policy analyst. Ms. Gallo is a member of the Municipal Management Association of Northern California, Emerge California, and the New Leaders Council of Oakland. She comes to us with a Master's of Business Administration degree from Santa Clara University and a Bachelor of Arts in Legal Studies from UC Berkeley. I'm happy to report she's hit the ground running and I've authorized her to participate in the IT Advisory Committee alongside board member Susan Granzella. With that, please join me in welcome, welcoming Ms. Amanda Gallo. Welcome. Also joining us here in person are the following CSLB staff. Registrar David Vogt, Chief Deputy Registrar Mike Jamnetsky, Chief of Public Affairs Catherine White, Chief of Information Technology Jason Perez. And joining us for our first in-person board meeting is Board Counsel John Kin. Where's John? Oh, there we go. Yep, sat down. Um, John, it's my understanding that you have an office at CSLB headquarters and have provided outstanding legal counsel to the board and staff, so thank you. Joining us by WebEx back in California are CSLB staff, Chief of Legislation, Fauna Lamar, 
Chief of Enforcement, Steve Grove, Licensing Manager, Carol Gagnon, Budgets Manager, Stacy Paul, Public Information Manager, Rico Garcia, who is serving as our WebEx meeting moderator today, and Executive Analyst, Mariah Rivera, whose voice you've already heard this afternoon. Uh, so on behalf of our board and staff, we want to thank everyone here at the United Brotherhood of Carpenters International Training Center for hosting us. We were here last in June of 2018 and are pleased to be back. And I'm particularly pleased to acknowledge Western District Vice President Pete Rodriguez for his role in obtaining this facility and also for his efforts supporting Jacob Lopez in joining this board. So we're very happy to have Jacob and glad for both of those things. So Mr. Rodriguez, my understanding is um, you're available and would to say a few words. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Well, welcome, welcome to the ITC, bienvenidos. Um, this campus is uh, about 1.2 million square feet of, of a training center. Uh, a year we uh, run through uh, this facility about 15,000 members. Uh, and uh, we invest collectively throughout the United Brotherhood of Carpenters about $200 million in, in our training. Um, uh, our carpenters, uh, our members uh, are represented in, uh, here in the United States, Puerto Rico, and in Canada. Uh, and here, for the most part, what you, I think you guys are going on a, on a tour tomorrow, right? But you'll see a lot of uh, locations there where you see train the trainer and some of the uh, uh, more uh, uh, you know, delicacies that we got to get into to make sure that our, uh, our apprentices are receiving the best training by the best trainers. So they come here and then we disperse them back to their respective locations. But as you've seen today, Thursday is a very big day for us here. We start to bring in members from all over the country. They learn about more than just wearing tools on their sides, uh, on, their, on, their, on their hips. Here is where we speak to apprentices about leadership and about what does it mean to get to the next level. We talk to our journeyman leadership uh, program about doing an extra effort to make sure that our contractors are, are, are continuing to be successful. Uh, and then we also have a conversation of, hey, if you're representing me as a labor organization, why do you care if a contractor is successful? So we get into that whole conversation about if the contractors are successful, we continue to work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, We've got a, a foreman program here, steward program here, and then we also bring in our contractors uh, and we have a collaborative leadership where they get together with the business representatives, uh, with rank and file and contractors, and we collaboratively come in here and we talk about issues that are going on on the job sites and how can we solve them together and then get back and, and go to work. That way there's nothing being left or lost in translation. Delegate meetings uh, and training here to make sure that the delegates in the process understand what their roles and responsibilities are uh, and so forth. Uh, but more importantly, uh, on communication. We really focus on our members' ability to communicate and to use everything that's between their ears. For a carpenter, and no disrespect to the other trades that I know that are, are represented here, you know, for many times we're the first ones on, last ones off. Uh, many of our members, they're the project managers, they're the superintendents, they're the foremen, but you can't do those jobs if you don't have the ability to communicate with the little old lady that we're helping cross the street, with the iron workers and the laborers and making sure that everybody's uh, uh, on the same page for scheduling purposes and so forth. And then also being able to, to, to speak with the end users to make sure that we're successful with the goal of like any other uh, uh, contractor or developer. And that's to make sure that the job gets done uh, on time, under budget, and it gets done safely. With you guys here, for us, it's extremely important um, for us, and, and like when, when he said, uh, Jacob asked me uh, if it was okay if we could open up our facility. I said, absolutely. Uh, and one of the reasons why I wanted you guys to be here and to have my, this, my time with you is the, the market's changing uh, in California and in Nevada. There's a major need for housing. and uh, Housing's going to be built. The question is, who's going to build it? Right now, I could guarantee you, I could walk you into any housing track and we will find unlicensed contractors. We'll find workers that are being taken advantage by criminal contractors, labor brokers, coyotes, et cetera, et cetera. 
And I'm not just saying this because it's my, it's part of my my gig as a, as a vice president or as a union a labor leader and so forth. I experienced it. I seen it. I come from a compliance. Uh, 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 program for 16 years where we, we assisted the enforcement agencies to give them the information on this kind of conduct. But the only way that we're going to build a better California and build a better Nevada is if we make sure that there's a level playing field and that's where you guys come in. You're the first step towards a contractor coming into compliance and making sure that they play by a level uh, a set of rules for everybody. That's everybody from the landscaper to the carpenter, to the iron worker, the laborer, and so forth. Everybody deserves to be paid uh, a, a fair wage. Nobody should have to live off the books and try to figure out where next week's uh, paycheck is coming from. And definitely nobody as a contractor should be able to be undermining our legitimate tax paying contractors that do everything they can to stay above water but every day somebody's trying to take their needs out by using some illegal practice and so forth. So I really wanna thank you for the work that you guys have done, but I really want you to know that as an organization, we're here to support you with anything you need to make sure that you guys have the, to the tools necessary, even if it means bringing folks in here to have these kind of meetings and conferences and so forth. Wanted to recognize uh, uh, California State License Board, David Falk, uh, Folk for, for being here today. Thank you for, for coming in and your leadership. Uh, Diana Love, Vice Chair, thank you for being here, ma'am. Uh, also, uh, I was told that uh, earlier in 2023, Diana Love, uh, you reported that you were gonna be running for Secretary of the California Democrat, Democratic Party. I believe there's a congratulations that's in order, right? You are successful at that. Congratulations for that. And then I, I definitely want to uh, welcome the other trades. Uh, many times you hear about um, the trades fight with each other and so forth, but the reality is when you're passionate about some people get emotional and they get excited. At the end of the day, let there be no doubt that we're all on the same page with fighting for the best interests of our members, making sure that they have the union jobs, the union wages, and the union benefits. And if they're not union members, that they have the highest standard possible so that way they have the ability to feed their families and you're not really undermining a system, but you're actually living your parents' American dream. And you guys are that first stepping stone towards building that foundation. So on behalf of Western District Carpenters for host perfect venue we're able to have. So with that, let's move on to item B, which is public comment for items not on the agenda and future agenda. This would be the time where you can make them. If you do have comments on one of our agenda items, we encourage you to wait until we get to that item. We will give you an opportunity to, okay? And Rico, can you please check to see if there are any members of the public who wish to address the board or offer a possible agenda item for a future meeting? Okay. We do not have any hands raised from the public. All right, thank you very much. So next is agenda item C, presentation of certificates of recognition. So today we're recognizing board member Johnny Simpson, whose term ends at the end of the month. Board member Simpson is one of the longest serving members of the board, appointed by the Senate Rules Committee in 2015. In his time as a public member, um, let's see here. Oh, here we go. In his time as a public member, Mr. Simpson has been a tireless advocate for the trades and has provided his influential voice on countless issues before the board over the last eight years. In 2020 and 21, he provided leadership as the board chair during the COVID-19 pandemic and CSLB's structural budget imbalance and emergency fee increase regulations. So I've got a lot of the fun stuff. <laughs> He's provided a voice of support and knowledge for board members and staff in his time on the board. And I will now read the plaque. The Contractor State License Board thanks Johnny Simpson, board member 2015 to 2023 and board chair 20 to 21, in recognition of your outstanding contributions to the Contractor State License Board, the people of California, and the construction industry. Thank you for a job well done. Um, so we have a few comments. Tonight. Yeah, Let's it's see. back now. Okay, can you hear me? Terrific. So let's start out with um, David. I understand you'd like to make a comment. 
Yeah, thank you, Chair Tiger. In March of 2020, they, they uh, declared COVID-19 to be a pandemic. Johnny Simpson was the board chair at that time. And I can't thank Johnny enough for his support, his meeting with staff, you know, and, and helping to helping us to make the right decisions on closing offices and still maintaining our, our, you know, our expectations, still protecting the public, still processing licenses. So Johnny is, you know, as a board member and chair, he's always been very receptive to meeting with staff, you know, answering questions. I really want to thank you for your eight years, Johnny. It's a pleasure working with you. Do any other board members in the room have a comment? Miguel. And thank you. Uh, and Johnny, uh, I appreciate uh, you taking me a little bit under your wing, even though uh, you're an electrician and I'm a carpenter. Uh, your, your knowledge was instrumental in helping me understand the board and, and, and your friendship uh, was appreciated in, in uh, making me feel at home, comfortable, and sharing your knowledge with that. I thank you. Thank you, board member Galarza. Any other comments in the room? I do. Okay, Susan. So Johnny, I have to add that we came on the board at, at the same time. And while I was not part of the trades, I was still trying to learn what the board did. And it was obvious that you knew what you were doing. And that you, when we would, uh, over the last eight years, have discussions and the moment it went sideways or something, Johnny was always there, never hesitating to remind us that we we have a goal in mind and, and uh, what your opinion might be. It wasn't always, I think, the right one, but we never knew, you know. It was it was always great to have your enthusiasm and what you added to the board. So thank you very much and you will be missed. Thank you. Okay, uh, Diana. Yes, when I came onto the board, uh, Johnny was the chair and he was very kind and to me and mentored me and gave me advice as to what to look for, what to listen for, and what to do. And it has been most appreciated and has stuck with me all this time. And you will be truly missed. Thank you. Michael? Yes, Johnny, what can, what can we say? I, I will say, as soon as I joined this board, I you were one of the first to come and say, congratulations, welcome to the board. And I, that mentorship and guidance that I, I know throughout your entire career, it's been stellar. I will say, you're retired from your official job, and now you're retiring from our board, and you're going to have so much more time for the things that you want to do in life. So uh, congratulations, Johnny. Thank you. Any other comments? And I get to back clean up and say how much I've appreciated working with you, Johnny. It's I've appreciated the fellowship and your professionalism and constant engagement. So super glad to have gotten to serve with you, and congratulations on your retirement. Um, are there any uh, board members off-site that have a comment? Any comments from the public here in the room? And Rico, can you please check to see if there's any comment from members of the public? Uh, oh, we have no hands raised. Perfect. So with that, John, if you'll come up, we'll just take a quick picture and give you your beautiful. Oh my God. Okay, so next we will move to agenda item D1, the review and possible approval of March 21, 2023 board meeting minutes, which begin on page 11. So board comment, board members here in Nevada or remotely offsite, do you have any edits to the March 21st, 2023 board meeting minutes? I see none here, um, any remotely offsite? Okay, may I have a motion to approve the March 21st, 2023 board meeting minutes? We'll motion to Wayne, approved. Awesome. So it sounds like maybe Alan made a motion and Jim, are you seconding it? Yes. Lovely, thank you. Are there any further board member comments or questions before we take public comment? Okay, not seeing any. Are there any comments from the public here in the room? Nope, and Rico, can you please check to see if there are any comments from members of the public? 
Okay. Public comments? comment. Thank you. Are there any board member comments or questions before I ask for the vote? Okay, roll call. Mary wow. Teichert. Approved. Rodney Cobos, approved absence. David De La Torre. Aye. Miguel Galarza. Amanda Gallo. Don't I abstain? Yeah, abstain. <laughs> Alan Guy. Aye. Susan Granzella. Aye. Jacob Lopez. Aye. Diana Love. Aye. Michael Mark. Aye. Stephen Pinelli, approved absence. Jim Ruane. Aye. Johnny Simpson. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. So next we'll move to agenda item D2, the election of officers. So note for those following along, there is intentionally no written content in the board packet for items D2, 3, and 4. At our March 21st, 2023 board meeting, I appointed board members Susan Granzella and David De La Torre to serve on a two-person nomination committee to recommend to the board a slate of officers for chair, vice chair, and secretary for the next fiscal year, which starts July 1st. I now turn the floor over to David De La Torre. For this. The recommendation is the following. Diana Love for chair. Michael Mark for vice chair. Miguel Galarza for secretary. With that, I turn it back to you, Chair Tyke. Thank you. We will now begin the nomination process. For each officer position, I will state the nominated candidate that the committee recommends. Then I will ask if there is a motion from LaFleur for any other individuals the board members would like to nominate for that position. We do not need a motion for the persons that have already been recommended by Susan and David, only if there is an alternative recommendation. All floor nominations will require a second. Candidates will then be given up to two minutes to make their statement or describe their qualifications for the position. Then we will take a roll call vote for each nominee in alphabetical order. If there's only one nominee for the position, members can vote by yes, no, or abstain. If there are multiple candidates for a position, then board members will vote in alphabetical order by stating the candidate's name they support. If there are multiple candidates, the first nominee to be named by a majority of the votes will win that officer position. I will now proceed to the nomination for the office of chair. The committee recommends nomination of Diana Love. Are there other nominations from the, for the office of chair from the floor? Gerontology. And for the past 25 plus years, I've dedicated my work history and volunteerism to issues that impact communities, children, youth, seniors, and disabled and veterans throughout the 58 counties. My focus has been about the protection of individuals' rights, health, safety, housing, and legislation. For CSLB, these protections are vital to uphold the principles that we stand for to protect the public. It has been an honor to serve as a public member representing a senior organization and also as secretary and vice chair to this body. I have had the privilege to add language to the mission statement and honored to have made history to be among the first all women board in 2021 and have served on all the committees and have learned from many here today. I look forward to your vote to serve as chair with the acquired knowledge that I have received along the way and the guidance of Registrar David Folk, board members past and present, staff, and the public. I look forward to our future success in continuing CSLB's mission, vision, and values, providing regulatory oversight protection of consumers and licensed contractors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any comments from the public? Okay, so Mariah, can you please call the roll? Rodney Cobost, approved absence. David De La Torre? Aye. Miguel Galarza? Aye. Amanda Gallo? Aye. Alan Guy? Aye. Susan Granzella? Aye. Jacob Lopez? Aye. Diana Love? Michael Mark? Aye. Stephen Pinelli, approved absence. Jim Ruane? Aye. 
Johnny Simpson. Aye. Mary Tyker. Aye. Okay, so that passes for chair. Congratulations. So next is the nomination of vice chair. The committee recommends nomination of Michael Mark. Are there any other nominations for vice chair from the floor? Okay, seeing none, I will now close the nominations and invite Michael Mark to make a statement. Well, I continue uh, to serve on this board. I, in this current capacity as secretary, I appreciate everyone's time so far here. I've learned so much from David and I will, as we continue on as vice chair, continue to serve as a public member of this board as a, a labor organization. Um, so far, I've learned so much and I continue the success and hopefully as a board, we're gonna continue the hard work we're doing together. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Are there any comments from the public? Okay, so in that case, Brian, can you please call roll? Rodney Cobos, approved absence. David De La Torre? Aye. Miguel Galarza? Aye. Amanda Gallo? Aye. Alan Guy? Aye. Susan Granzella? Aye. Jacob Lopez? Aye. Diana Love? Aye. Michael Mark? Aye. Stephen Pinelli approved absence. J Jim Ruane? Aye. Johnny Simpson? Aye. Mary Tykert? Aye. Motion passes. Okay, congratulations, Michael. Thank you. And then finally, the nomination of board secretary. The committee recommended Miguel Galarza. Are there any other nominations from the floor? Okay, there being no other nominations, I will close the nominations. And Miguel, would you like to make a brief statement? Yeah, um, and David Folk told me two minutes max. So, uh, so with that, you know, th this year is my 31st year being a contractor in the state of California. And um, when I when I joined the board four years ago and had the honor to to represent contractors, I, at least that's what I thought I was doing. And then I realized the greater mission, and I was in, I was tutored on what the mission really was, and we are consumer protection, and and so that was a a, a change in my paradigm. This is what why am I here and what am I supposed to be doing, and so. With that, I, um, I had the, the privilege of serving as, as a licensing chair and, and helping to understand some of the nuances of, of the licensing and, and specifically the, uh, um, the national um, reciprocity agreements that are an ongoing debate between us and other states of California and helping with that. And, and then last year, I was, I was honored to be the, the legislative chair and with uh, some uh, tutoring and guidance with from uh, uh, Jim Ruane, uh, he showed me the ropes of how to do that uh, and, and learned a lot about some of the issues revolving um, the changes in the legislation to protect the public. And um, I, I'm honored to uh, be considered. I'm honored uh, for the nomination group to think that I, I had the ability to do this and so uh, I look forward to continuing to advocate for uh, for contractors who are not um, who are below the radar to become licensed, and to make sure that they see that they to to be above board and to uh, play by the rules, and encouraging smaller contractors to to seek licensing. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed being with you uh, a year ago and uh, in uh, advocating for women in construction, and um, so. I, a couple of weeks ago, we did a senior stop and that was fantastic. I really had a great time and uh, and hopefully continue to do that and advocate for for all of us to uh, to be the face of CSLB and make sure that the public knows that we're here to protect them. And so thank you again for nominating me. Look forward to serving. Thank you very much, Miguel. Are there any comments from the public? Okay. So board members, you will need to state by name who you're voting for. I'm not sure why that is, actually, since it was a committee nomination. Okay, cool. Awesome. Good. So thank you very much. 
Okay, so Mariah, can you please call the roll? Rodney Cobos, approved absence. David De La Torre? Aye. Miguel Galarza? Aye. Amanda Gallo? Aye. Alan Guy? Aye. Susan Granzella? Aye. Jacob Lopez? Aye. Diana Love? Aye. Michael Mark? Aye. Stephen Pinelli, approved absence. Jim Ruane? Aye. Johnny Simpson? Aye. Mary Tykert? Aye. Motion passes. Fantastic. Congratulations to all of our new officers. The newly elected chair, vice chair, and secretary will assume the duties of their respective officers on July 1st. Okay, so before. Okay, so my apologies. There's, we're going to, before we move to D3, we're going to call for public comment again for items not on the agenda because there were technical challenges, which I'm sure we're all shocked by. So someone tried. Uh, may I once again call for public comment oh. on items not on the agenda? Yes, Debbie Rodriguez, you are unmuted and you have three minutes to speak. Oh, can you hear me then? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, as noted, uh, my name is Debbie Rodriguez. I have brought an issue before the board before and uh, it is not fully resolved. One is, is pertaining to cities, counties, and other forms of municipal organizations hiring unlicensed contractors. It's mostly revolving around the public um, uh, display of art, uh, painting murals on uh, buildings and walls, or designing and and installing artwork on public grounds. And they are hiring unlicensed contractors, in, and it's not any small thing. These contracts run in the tens of thousands, sometimes in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the governments that, that are putting out these contracts are uh, disregarding the law. Some of them are just outright flouting it. They just don't care. The letters that I've received from, from them um, say they, they just don't apply. They, they, they say that, um, you know, uh, artwork is, is not painting and decorating. It's, it's ridiculous. And um, I don't understand why we were going out there and performing stings of small time operators uh, around the state when there's such easy pickings right here and easy any you find any city, any county, they're all doing it these days. They put out requests for proposals and they, they say that's not the same thing as a bid, but it all ends up in the same thing where an unlicensed contractor comes on, he performs the work, they get paid from the city, and it's way more than $500. So I wonder why the board is not addressing this. Let's get this huge budding industry out there of murals, uh, painters, artwork, and stuff like that, that is now gaining popularity. And all of these people that are putting in these bids are being led to slaughter in a sense. They're, they're being you know made to believe. That have you have one minute remaining? Off. I'm sorry? You have one minute remaining. Okay. They, they don't believe that they're breaking the law because the cities and the counties, they're, even the attorneys for the cities and the counties are telling them that they're not. And I have that in writing. They have written that to me. Not the artists themselves. Some of them, yes. But I'm talking about uh, attorneys for the city and, and the counties. They, they just don't believe that the law applies to them. And I think that this board should do something about that because I have brought this before. It's been a year before I, or so since I've been here, but it's still happening. It's actually accelerating. So that's what I wanted to say. Okay, well, thank you for uh, calling in and making some comments and our registrar, David Fote, will follow up with you directly on the content of your comments. So thanks. Any other public comments? No more public comments. Okay, thank you very much. In that case, we will turn to agenda item D3, the 2023 Sunset Subcommittee appointments, which I will turn over to Registrar David Fote. 
Thank you, Chair Tykert. I have an update on the uh, sunset review process I wanted to share with everyone this afternoon. This item is an update on the board uh, sunset hearings that we've kind of we've had in the past. And we have to have every four years. So what happens as a border bureau is you're required to go in front of the Senate every one to four years. The last time the contractors board was reviewed was on February 26, 2019. At that time, public member Marlo Richardson was the chair and contractor member Kevin Albanese was the past chair. Uh, Marlo and Kevin were appointed as the uh, Sunset Review Advisory Committee, the two-person advisory committee. I had the privilege of testifying with Marlo and Kevin at, at the hearing at that time. And I will say this, Marlo and Kevin did a fantastic job. We got out of there with flying colors. The Senate greatly appreciated the work the board's been doing. And because of that, we were extended another four years. So if they don't think you're doing a good job, you may have to come back in one year, but if you're doing a good job, then you get a four-year extension. Now, what happened because of the pandemic is there was Senate Bill 1443 by Senator Roth that extended the CSLB to a five-year window. So we didn't have to come back after four years. We've got to come back now after five years. And in 2018, when we went before the Senate, we had to provide answers to 67 questions. So when I was looking at the report, I shared this with Mary a few weeks ago. I think it was over 400 pages. Amazing. But there were 67 questions back then we had to answer. What we have to do this round is we have to provide an update on those 67 questions. And we will also have to answer any new questions the legislature may have. As as far as I know, we've not received the questionnaire from the Sunset Review Committee at this time. We anticipate receiving those questions in the next few weeks. So staff will do most of the work in writing the report and coming up with the subject matter or the answers to the questions. But it's very important that the board be involved in the process. And so because of that, I have asked Chair Tykert to appoint a two-person advisory committee that staff can work with on the report. And the plan is to bring answers to those 67 questions and the new questions to the board, uh, maybe just the highlights, perhaps most of them, I don't know, but we'll bring it to the board in September so you're well aware of what we're working on and the approach we're taking because at the December board meeting, it's critical that the full board approve our sunset report that we're going to submit to the legislature. It is due January, 2024. So we wanna keep the board involved every step of the way. We're gonna give you a status update in September, and we're gonna ask that you approve the report in December. And then we expect to be uh, testifying sometime in February or March. And I do want to just close by saying that Fauna Lamar, our chief of legislation, is taking the lead on the report. And so, you know, her work's cut out for her, but fortunately for all of us, she has a lot of experience in, in, in uh, preparing sunset review reports. So that would be my update. Thank you very much, Registrar Fote. So for the sunset review subcommittee, I will appoint public member Diana Love and contractor member Miguel Galarza to be the uh, board advisory to the process. Um, and begin by asking for comments. So board members in the room, does any board member have a comment on this process as described? Okay, um, board members offsite have a comment. Any public comments here in the room? And any public offsite? Rico, can you please check to see if we have any members of the public commenting? No public comment. Thank you very much. So that concludes this item. No action is required by the board. Thank you. Um, Also want to state for the administrative record that Miguel Galarza obviously has joined us. And so he came here following the attendance roll call, but he is at the meeting. So that's added to our record. Okay, now we'll move on to item D4, the registrar's report. This is an oral update only. There's no supporting content in the packet and I will turn it over to registrar Fote. Great, thank you. So I have an update on our our efforts to retain two consultants. As you'll recall, December 8th, 2022, uh, the board approved spending $50,000 to $100,000 to hire a consultant to perform an an enforcement, workload, and process improvement study. 
And I reported at that time that we were in negotiations with Cooperative Personnel Services, otherwise known as CPS, to perform that study. Uh, I'm pleased to report that CPS came back with a price of $68,000, so that's less than the $75,000 allocated. And the contract is with DCA. And the last, well, I heard two days ago that the they were very optimistic. The analyst stated that it's very likely the contract will be be signed and executed by the end of this month. I mean, if nothing else, that's the goal. So that contract is moving forward. Now we're having a little more difficult with the with hiring the second consultant. And if you recall, the board authorized spending up to seventy-five thousand dollars to find to um, to hire a consultant to identify just how much unlicensed practice is out there. We all know there's a lot of unlicensed practitioners, but just how many are there? Uh, we know how many proactive enforcement staff we have. We have 27 investigators. We, don't, we have 58 counties in California. We don't have an investigator for every county. Uh, we've had, and I've reported at prior meetings that we've worked with Senator McGuire, our Senate leader, on how we can effectively protect consumers and declare disaster areas and make sure we have the resources we need when we have a bad actor in those areas to take action timely, to take effective action. So. What resources do we need for disasters as far as enforcement and having a proactive uh, presence in those areas? We've reached out to three universities. We've talked to a consultant. I talked to a consultant that's done a lot of work for the Department of Consumer Affairs and CSLB. And we, we found a consultant that had performed, it's a nonprofit that had performed a similar study many years, and back in 2024, 2014 to be specific, and we talked to them about whether they'd want to do it. We reached out to the universities and the prior consultant and, and this nonprofit because we wouldn't have to use the, uh, we call it the request for proposal process, which is quite, can be, up, can be time consuming, can take up to a year to hire a contractor through that process. We, so we wanted to find someone that has a master service agreement with the state so we could simply contract with them. That's why we were contacting those entities. But only one of them sh uh, showed any interest and that was a nonprofit problem there is they wanted at least $300,000, significantly more than $75,000 allocated. So I talked to Michael Mark about it, and the thought is we're going to have to go with the request for proposal process. So we are working on that now. Uh, that will give us an opportunity to clearly modify the scope of the contract. Uh, it may well, it may not be able to be done for $75,000, but we don't know what the cost would be. We're going to go forward, our plan is anyways, to go forward with a $75,000 cap and just see what happens. And if we can't find a consultant for that price, I would come back to the board and ask that there be consideration on raising it. So that's, that's kind of where we're at right now. But as far as the RFP, right now, DCA is working on the, Department of Consumer Affairs is working on the RFP for us. But because... There are many contracts that have a June 30th expiration date. They've tabled it until July. So I don't have an update on just when that would be done. I don't know if, uh, if Mike Chemnitsky, if you have any more information than that, other than they told us they'd be getting to it in July. But that's where we're at as far as hiring the second consultant. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Do any board members? Oh, Mike, did you know I'm done. Okay, so uh, do any board members in the room have comments? Any board members off-site? Any comments from the public here in the room? Enrico, can you please check to see if there's comments from members of the public? No public comment. Okay, so thank you very much, Dave. Appreciate the update. And this concludes this item. No action is required by the board. So we'll turn now to item D5, budget update, which begins on page 41 of your board packet. So the CSLB budgets manager, Stacy Paul, is going to give us a budget update. Uh, thank you, board chair, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the budget update begins on page 41 of your packet. The first page summarizes the budget and projected expenditures for this fiscal year, 22-23. With an authorized budget of 80 million, we are projecting to bring in roughly 92.5 million and spending approximately 78 million on board expenditures. This should increase our reserves to 17 million, which is just over two months of operating expenses. If you flip the page, the first chart shows fiscal year 22-23 budget and expenditures through April. 
nothing too exciting. In fact, we're spending less than we expect than expected at only 80% of our budgeted authority. The chart directly below shows our revenue through April. Overall, we're doing well in bringing in slightly more revenue than projected while still exceeding prior year revenue by 20%. On the next page, this chart is our fund condition, which projects um, out to budget year 23-24. The middle column is our current year, where it shows our beginning fund balance at 9.1 million. If year and projections are realized as discussed on page 41, then reserves at year end should be 17.2 million, which is roughly 2.4 months in reserve. If you look at the last column, that's next fiscal year, you can see we should continue to gradually replenish our reserves to 20 million, getting us closer to almost three months in reserves. Flipping the page, page 44, the chart is the CMEA fund condition. As you all know, um, previously for this fiscal year, we increased our authority um, to 175,000 appropriation. This same process is getting um, is beginning this fiscal year as we speak, um, as the fund is healthy and continues to receive an increase in donations from our licensees. At the next board meeting, we hope to have an update on the status of a, us increasing this appropriation. Lastly, let me quickly touch on the statistics to uh, statistical summary details on the next three pages. No big surprises through April. We're seeing an increase in new apps and HIS um, and our active license population seems to be stabilizing um, as it's the same as the last over the last year. This concludes the budget update unless anybody has questions. Thank you, Stacy. So we'll start with board members in the room. Is that the same as questions or comments? Because that's what I ask for next is you guys. Board members, please go ahead with your questions. <laughs> so I guess I'll go first. Uh, question or comment? Uh, th thank you, Stacy. Uh, I had a question on page 42. Uh, I, I know we, because of the wildfires, we've had a lot of use of emergency, emergency use for staff. Is that why our overtime budget is a little bit higher. And then a second part of the question for Stacy. Uh, thank you for all the hard work. I think I saw a memo that a lot of the overtime money has came back from uh, for doing this extra work from mainly enforcement staff. So maybe that's a two part question there. Yes, so the overtime budget line item is definitely attributed to the disaster response efforts. So basically we staff have to charge their time, which hits our fund, and then we get a general fund reimbursement, which goes back into our reserve account to cover those costs that we expended. So far we've received 1.3 million in recovery costs for our efforts. And that includes basically overtime, regular staff time, uh, per diem, all the, the travel costs due to the vehicles, driving mileage, everything like that. So yeah. We were successful, so that was exciting with all the work that everybody's put into that. Thank you, Stacy. That's I wanted to make sure it's public record that all the hard work <laughs> that you've done on that endeavor. So thank you. Sure, thank you, Michael. Susan. Hi, Stacy. Um, board member Susan Granzella asking you yet another question about the budget, but I'm really glad um, that you're on the uh, call. So looking on page 42, we have exam proctor. And the, while those figures are not very high, was that the leftover of the uh, transition to PSI for the testing? Yes, so that next fiscal year, I'm hoping to move those funds into another pot of money. So it was the little bit of leftover limited term staff that we had to hire when we were shutting down all the, the testing facilities, probably in the beginning of the fiscal year. Okay, and the question, the next one, um, and I know because we did have the transition in the past year, we should be able to do the comparison between the CSLB, um, what the old system was and PSI, and what those savings are and the added benefits. So again, I think after the close of the year, we should be able to do that. But where, what line item does include the actual cost of PSI? Is it under 
operating expenses or exams? It's currently under operating expenses. I was trying to figure out where we want to capture that. If you guys want to see that as a, line, a separate line item, we can do that. Right now, we're paying, we have a budget for about two million for PSI, and I think we're going to expend all of that. The oh. only issue there, I think, eventually, we would like to pursue legislation to um, have individuals pay that fee rather than us collect it and then pay PSI to administer the exam. So not sure how we want to pursue that down the road. Okay, good. Thank you. And then the line item for enforcement, obviously enforcement, the salary and wages for the enforcement staff is included under personnel services. But can you, t uh, the $10 million, so almost 11, that was part of the budget. What exactly was that for? The expenses of so that would be Attorney General's Office um, operate, or OAH, Administrative oh. Hearings. Okay, that's that's included there in yes un, under enforcement, even though it might be re related to other issues. All right. Yes. Okay, those were the questions I had. Thank you very much, and thank you for all the hard work. You're welcome. Okay, um, Board Member Miguel Galarza. Yes, Stacy. I had a quick question on page 41. Um, it seems to me that the months in reserves looks pretty good. Is that something that we uh, that we're tracking? What is the optimum months in reserve that we're looking for under CSLB? So I believe it's by statute. It's three to six months is where they would like to have us within that bubble. Um, we definitely don't want to get above the six months. So we're trying to get within like that four to five range would be ideal in case there's a recession or anything like that. Because, you know, two months in operating expenses, if something were to happen, that wouldn't sustain us for very long. I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Are there any other? Oh, Alan. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Steve. I don't know if this is for you or David, but on page 45, Original applications received are up almost 17%. But on page 46, original licenses issued is down 19%. Should we be concerned with those statistics? Or is there anything we need to dig into? That might be more of a licensing question. Um, I'm not sure if that's because we do have a backlog, if that's attributed to that. So as original apps are received, they're obviously going to post them in the in the um, system, and then there might be a delay based on how long it's taking them to take an exam or get their license. I'm not sure of all that. This is Dave. I, I would like for Carol Gagnon, who I believe is with us today, to respond to that because it is kind of surprising to see those numbers and that we are at a, almost a record low for processing times now for our original apps. So. Is that kind of a holdover when we were somewhat backlogged? Carol, could you could you answer that question? Certainly. So first of all, what's happening is we do have a little bit of a backlog still because of COVID and because of also we finally increased staffing and licensing, so it's going down, but it's taking a while to catch up. We also have the problem of in the old days, we would automatically schedule their exam. That's it, you're approved for an exam, you're taking your test in three weeks. Well, now they can pick their exam date at PSI because they have a choice of 20 test centers. They can pick you know, evening hours, everything. So our candidates are pushing out a little farther to give themselves more time to study, but that means we end up more of them sitting in that application approved, not yet licensed waiting period, waiting for them to take their exam and find the optimum time for themselves. This is a lot of what's happening. That makes sense. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from board members? Any uh, public comment from public in the room? How about online? So Rico, can you please check to see if there are comments or questions from members of the public online? No public comment. Thank you. So that concludes this item. And uh, thank you very much for all the questions and comments. No action is required of the board. And we will turn over to item D6, which is um, review, discussion, and possible action on 2224 Administrative and Information Technology 
strategic plan objectives. So we'll turn over to page 51 of your packet and I will turn it over to Chief Deputy Registrar Mike Jamnetsky. Thank you, Chair Tykert, and good afternoon, everybody. This uh, strategic plan item is shared by the Administrative Division and the Information Technology Division. And uh, one of our, our admin chief is not uh, on site today and our IT chief is here, but rather than shift back and forth, I thought I would just go through these quickly. Um, strategic plan item 5.1, information technology security is always an ongoing priority and the objective is to update the board at each meeting. You will hear that shortly in the IT update. 5.2, uh, this is really about um, receiving feedback from our stakeholders and public licensees, people that use our services. How are we doing, frankly, on, on any of it? Um, so we're uh, posting surveys uh, in lobbies and in uh, Northern California and Southern California, as well as um, working on some surveys for the online renewal. Uh, and this actually ties in with the strategic objective for public affairs, which we'll hear about later on that involves improving overall user experience on the website. We're gonna try to get together a consumer group. We just wanna hear from the people that use our services. How are we doing? Uh, 5.3, you know, if you call our 1-800 number, um, I believe it's the same system we've had there since I started at CSLB in 2013. And it's um, tedious, I think, for people to get through. You have to be patient and listen um, and try to get a person. Uh, so it's really been a goal to try to identify a contractor to replace that entirely and join the 21st century. Um, and there's an update in here about efforts to secure a contractor for that. Um, item 5.4 about onboarding, training. Uh, there's a lot of information here. I think the, the important highlight really is uh, we're pretty proud of our efforts to request from DCA um, the opportunity to reclass our consumer services representatives. They're in the enforcement division and they handle um, the intake and the mediation, the first step of consumer complaints. And um, the CSR class, the consumer services representative class is an outdated class. They've slowly been whittled down. And I believe CSLV is one of the last boards throughout DCA that has CSRs. And we need to expand that class to be able to recruit for that position. So we believe we'll be successful reclassifying them as SSAs, which are the staff service analyst. It's a little bit more money. Uh, duties will be the same. And there are just countless um, uh, opportunities for SSAs throughout the state as, a, as opposed to the CSR class. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and then uh, item 5.5, this will be an IT update that you will hear about in the information technology um, update that you'll hear shortly. That's it for the strap plan. Thank you very much, Mike. Do any board members have a comment? Do any public members in the room have a comment? And does anyone online have a comment? Rico, can you please see if there are comments from members of the public? No public comment. Thank you. So that concludes this item. Thank you, Mike. No action is required of the board. And I'm about to turn it right back over to you with item D7, administration update regarding personnel and facilities. On Hello page again. 55 of your packet. And I will turn it back over to Chief Deputy Registrar, Mike Jemnetsky. Yeah, just a quick update on the administrative uh, office. Uh, there's not a whole lot new here other than we really want to highlight um, our our efforts in reducing vacancies. If you take a look at the chart on page 56, there's pretty much a steady decline throughout the year. Um, in in July of last year, we were at well over 10% vacancies and it was scary. Um, but I can report as of June 19, we're at 9%. Uh, so staff have done a great job of recruiting and filling positions. Uh, and that ties us right into employee recruitment there, the next item. We have a couple of dual efforts going on here. The administrative side of things uh, involves finding job fairs and getting the word out there and making sure we're following the rules when recruiting and hiring. But this is a joint effort with public affairs and the public affairs unit has done a great job at spearheading a social media campaign. I think for the first time that I'm aware of, we're paying for advertising space on, on like LinkedIn, um, just hey, apply for a CSLB job. And that, you know, we don't have metrics, but that could have contributed to uh, more staff coming to work for CSLB. So we're pretty uh, pleased about that. Um, and the rest is, uh, you heard about our contract, Dave talked about our consultant contracts, facilities. Um, we can answer any questions about this, but that's all we wanted to highlight for the admin update for today. Thank you very much, appreciate the update. Do any board members have a comment? 
Any members of the public in the room have a comment? Um, Rico, can you see if there are any comments from members of the public, please, online? No public comment. Thank you. So that concludes this item. No action is required of the board. Thank you very much. Now we'll turn over to D8 information technology update. So please look at page 61 of your board packet for the information technology update. And I will turn it over to CSLB Chief of Information Technology, Jason Perez. Thank you, Board Chair Tykert, and good afternoon, everyone. On page 61 begins the information technology update. And today I am providing an update on two important topics for the CSLB IT division, business modernization delay and IT security enhancements. These subjects have significant imp implications for the organization and are crucial to address to ensure a continued growth and success of CSLB. To start with business modernization initiative, as you may recall, at the last board meeting in March, the CSLB IT division embarked on a modernization project aimed at streamlining our application process, enhancing customer experience, and in improving internal efficiencies. The project aimed to leverage cutting edge technologies and innovative approach of approaches to transform our system and processes. However, I have regret to inform you that we have experienced unforeseen delays in this modernization effort. Despite the best intentions of the efforts of our dedicated team, we faced several challenges that affected the project timeline. These challenges included technical complexities and external dependencies beyond our control. We recognize the importance of this initiative and the urgency to bring, bring it back on track. <clears throat> Excuse me. To mitigate the delays and ensure successful implementation, we have taken the following steps. We have engaged with our partner, Department of Consumer Affairs, to enlist their support to identify a new software platform. Their perspective, insights, and recommendations will assist in overcoming the obstacles that we did encounter. Then also too, we will revise the project plan. Based on the review and, and their uh, expert advice, we'll revise the project plans considering the necessary adjustments and address the issues that hindered the progress. Our commitment to modernizing the CSOB remains unwavering and we are, continue, we are confident that we'll, we have a revised plan. We will get back on track and achieve our objectives. We'll provide, provide you with regular updates on progress and milestones as we move forward. We currently have vendors scheduled over the next few weeks to review solutions on the online application. We anticipate having a project, completed, a project plan completed by September. On June 8th, I did bring this to the attention of board member Susan Granzella, who was reappointed by Chair Tykert to the IT Advisory Committee. Susan, would you like to make any comments? You didn't tell me I had to speak. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was saying I was delighted to be working with you on this. And as Mary uh, uh, was able to explain, Amanda, our new board member, Amanda Gaio, will be joining us. So hopefully in September, we'll have more specific information uh, because there are always things that <clears throat> happen in IT or any other business that are beyond our control. So specifics should be reported to the board next September. And uh, I'm looking forward to working with you on that. And Amanda. <laughs> Thank you, board member Granzella. Now turning our attention to IT security enhancements. In today's digital landscape, cyber threats continue to evolve. It is crucial that we remain vigilant and proactive in safeguarding our systems, data, and sensitive information. The CSLB IT division has made significant strides in enhancing our IT security posture. We have impl implemented a multi-layered security framework that includes the following measures. Robust firewalls and, uh, and intrusion detection systems. We have fortified our network infrastructure with advanced firewalls and, and an intrusion detection system to prevent unauthorized access to detect any suspicious activities. We also continue regular security audits and assessments. These regular security audits and assessments help identify vulnerabilities, weaknesses, and potential risk. This helps us proactively address any of these issues and strengthen our defenses. Also too, we have employee awareness and training. We believe that a well-informed and educated workforce is a vital component for a robust, robust security posture. Therefore, we have partnered with Department of Consumer Affairs to implement a comprehensive training program to raise awareness about security, cybersecurity's best practices, 
and promote a security conscious culture throughout CSLB. And lastly, we have an incident response plan. In the event of a security incident, we have updated our incident response plan to ensure a prompt and effective response, minimizing potential damage and downtime. While we have made significant progress in the last few months, we understand that cybersecurity is an ongoing journey and new threats will continue to emerge. Therefore, we are committed to regularly assessing and enhancing our security measures to stay ahead of evolving risk. In conclusion, the CSLB IT division remains dedicated to the successful modernization of our systems and the continuous improvement of our IT security. Despite the challenges we face with the modernization project, we are actively working to overcome them and get back on track. Simultaneously, we will continue to invest in robust IT security measures to safeguard our organization against potential threats. Thank you for your attention. I am open to any questions or feedback. So are there any questions or comments from board members? Okay, how about uh, from the public in the room? Rico, do we have any comments or questions from members of the public? No public comment. Okay, thank you very much, Jason. Appreciate the update and no action is required of the board. So that concludes this item. So next, please turn to page 65 of your board packet for a proposed amendment to the board's procedure manual recommended by staff. The changes are recommended to provide flexibility to conduct work to facilitate board approved proposals or actions without having to come back to the board for each action. This will enable staff to more effectively and timely communicate the board's position and carry out approved legislative proposals. So the draft amended language to the procedural manual that's currently printed on page 65 has been updated since the board packet was printed. The new language is displayed on a slide on the screen and board members, you also have it as a handout. Legislative Chief Fanna Lamar, can you please describe this recommended change to the board procedures manual as well as a suggested new language that's different than what's printed on page 65? Thank you, Chair Tykert. So staff are proposing to amend the board member administrative manual to enable staff to carry out the directives of the board. As you may know, the legislative calendar moves very quickly. Uh, since the last board meeting, many bills have been amended and have cleared sig several significant hurdles in the legislature. By our next meeting, all bills will be with the governor. Uh, when a bill is amended, the board's position statement only applies to the version in print when the board took the position. So the changes to the procedures would allow staff to continue communicating the board's position after a consultation with the legislative committee chair. The changes would also authorize staff to negotiate amendments in the best interest of CSLB's mission and board goals. Additionally, propo legislative proposals need significant work after board approval. The proposed changes would allow staff to find an author, provide testimony, and negotiate amendments to carry out the goal of the board. The authorization being requested is only extended in specific circumstances, and this is something that was added um, and is new on your new printout, um, where we limit it to specific circumstances in the final paragraph. Um, to those actions stated. So those would be legislative proposals and amended bills on which the board took a position. I am happy to answer any questions and turn it back to Chair Piker. Thank you. Thank you. So the staff recommendation is that the board approve the suggested changes to page 16 of the board procedure manual, specifically that staff are authorized to work with one board member as opposed to two when seeking authority to take action on pending legislation when time constraints preclude meeting with the full board, as long as the board is notified as soon as possible of that position, that for board sponsored staff are, uh, let's see, that for board sponsored legislation, staff are authorized to communicate to the legislature the board's position on board sponsored legislation, as well as secure a legislative author for the proposal and negotiate amendments within the stated policy or purpose of that proposal. To clarify that staff has authority to communicate a position taken by the full board on introduced legislation, as well as to negotiate any amendments described in any recommendation approved by the board to support, neutral, or oppose unless amended. And finally, memorialize for the record that staff will not be taking any position not taken by the full board or authorized by the legislative chair when time constraints preclude full board action. So this has, do I have a motion to adopt the staff recommendation? I, there's some questions. The way that the process is set up, 
and you guys can check me on this, but I think we're going to have a motion in a second if there are such, and then we'll have questions and comments and then a vote after that. Okay. Thank so, yeah. Through the chair, Jim Ruane, so moved. Thank you. And Chair Member Guy, do you want to second that? Uh, yes. All right. So are there any uh, board member comments or questions before we take public comment? And first we'll ask Susan Granzella to comment or question. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you. So I do understand this and having been chair and there have been fast moving support uh, uh, communications that needed to go to the legislature. Um, really, this is just streamlining the way we are going to respond to find the legislative you know, uh, vehicle and, and all of those. But under what criteria are you setting where it is important to, when you've made a change significant enough that the board needs to make, to hear it? I mean, how are you going to be sending, will the registrar or legislative analyst send out a note that uh, we, we've made this change, you voted on this, it has changed this way. Under what criteria will you be notifying the board? Will it be at the board next board meeting or an email? I just wanted to know, because I, I agree it needs to be streamlined. Yeah, I would just, it's my understanding, this is just simply to streamline the process so we don't have to both contact the chair and the vice chair for a relatively minor issue. But these bills do change. They become controversial. There's something put into a bill we think would concern the board and absolutely come back to the board. So this is just to get an author and to write letters. One thing we do when we the board sponsors a bill or today you'll be voting on bills if you support a bill, we write letters uh, to to the legislature and in support of that bill. It would just give us the authorization to do that. But if there's anything controversial, we'll absolutely update you. And if there's something I think of your interest, I'll absolutely put in my update. Thank you. Other board questions or comments? Okay, um, and board member Ruane, if you have any comments, we'd love to have them as well. I'm kind of grouping the whole board together. Um, and then any public comments from the room? Enrico, can you please check to see if there are any comments from members of the public? No public comment. Okay, so in that case, let's call the roll, Mariah, if you would be so kind. Mary Tykert? Yes. Rodney Cobos, approved absence. David De La Torre? Aye. Miguel Galarza? Aye. Amanda Gallo? Aye. Alan Guy? Aye. Susan Granzella? Aye. Jacob Lopez? Aye. Diana Love? Aye. Michael Mark? Aye. Stephen Pinelli, approved absence. Jim Ruane? Aye. Johnny Simpson? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. So the motion has carried and I appreciate the work that went into that. It will be helpful to have that streamlining. So we'll turn over to item E, legislation, and I will begin with Legislative Committee Chair Miguel Galarza. Yeah, thank you, Chair Tiger. Um, I'm gonna begin the legislative agenda with agenda item E1, which is an update review and discussion and possible action on 2224 legislative strategic plan objectives. That, uh, by the way, begins on page 71 of your packet. The board's 2022-24 strategic plan identifies goals and objectives for the legislative division. Uh, Ifana Lamar will provide an update for each objective. Ifana, carry on. Hi, thank you, um, Legislative Chair Galarza. Um, I am actually going to only uh, provide an update for the two that have due dates this year. So the first one is strategic plan item 3.1 to host an annual legislative day to build proactive relationships with lawmakers and to enhance effectiveness. Um, scheduling conflicts and the legislative calendar prevented us from holding a legislative day this year. And we are so far into the legislative calendar, it's not feasible to request legislators time at this point. However, senior scam stopper events are a great way to meet with legislators and their staffers. So board member Galarza did meet with a legislator when he presented at an event hosted by Assemblymember Lee on June 9th. We heard 
uh, board member Galarza was very well received and well liked by the attendees. Um, next year, we will have multiple opportunities to meet with members of the legislature that comes along with the sunset review process. So uh, this objective will be easy to achieve starting next year and from that point forward. The other strategic plan item is 3.6, review and collaborate with local and state government to determine if CSLB's hazardous and asbestos certification remain viable and are effective in protecting consumers in declared disaster areas. That objective has a due date of July 2023. We plan to begin stakeholder consultations on this objective in July, which is the target completion date. With that, the legislative strategic plan update is complete. So I return the floor to Legislative Chair Galarza. And thank you, Fana. Um, are there any comments from board members uh, or questions on this item? I appreciate you representing us so well. Sounds like that was awesome. Thank you. Uh, hearing and seeing no others, um, this, this agenda item uh, is only an update. And, and so there's no motion that's required. And we can move on to the next legislative item, agenda item, which will be uh, E2. Review and discussion and possible action on, on 2023 pending legislation. There's a status summary for each bill that we will discuss, that we did discuss in the March board meeting, beginning on pages 75 and 76. Full bill analysis will follow on pages 77 through 95. We have several bills for which staff have recommended positions for providing updates. We'll begin with the following agenda item which is E2A, AB 336 by Assemblyman, Assembly Member Cervantes, which begins on page 77 of your material. This bill would apply to licensees who are not exempt from obtaining weapons comp insurance. This bill would require that those licensees to provide their top three workers comp compensation codes by payroll to CSLB at the time of renewal. This bill would also prohibit renewals without those codes, but would also authorize retroactive renewal if the licensee complies within 30 days after notification by the CSLB that the renewal was rejected. Fano, will you please discuss this bill? Thank you, Chair Galarza. Um, so, Although I provided a summary of the bills presented to the board, I wanted to let you know now I'll provide an updated status on each bill because there was a lot of movement in the legislature last week. So regarding AB 336, we discussed this bill at the board meeting in March and the board decided to watch the bill. Staff had concerns that because this bill addresses insurance fraud, CSLB's website may not provide the informational value to the public that the sponsors hope it would. Additionally, Board members had concerns that CSLB could incur liability from misreported workers' compensation codes posted on our website. There were also concerns that CSLB could be responsible for verifying or investigating whether the licensee provided the correct codes. This bill also comes at a cost of $227,000 to CSLB for changes to the IT systems. The sponsors of this bill amended the bill on April 27th to state that CSLB is not responsible for incorrectly reported codes posted to our website. So they listened to board member concerns. They also amended the bill to state that CSLB is not responsible for verifying or investigating the accuracy of those codes provided by licensees. The sponsor at that time asked for reconsideration of our fiscal. Um, IT Chief Prez's team reanalyzed the bill and the fiscal impact remains as it was before at $227,000. So despite staff concerns about the value posting these codes would provide, the sponsors addressed board amendment, board member uh, concerns on two separate occasions. Once to limit the reporting to the top three codes by payroll, that reduced the fiscal from over a million to $227,000. And they amended the bill again to eliminate CSLB's liability. Because of that, we're recommending a neutral position. 
Um, currently, this bill, it just passed the Senate Committee on Business Professions and Economic Development, and it's scheduled to be heard in the Committee on Appropriations on Monday, June 26th. That's my update for that bill. Thank you, Fana. The SAC recommendation, as Fana uh, described, is neutral. Uh, however, is there a motion uh, moving forward? Uh, Mark. Uh, Michael Mark here. I, I, my memory of the last meeting was to support if amended. So maybe if we can, were those were the amendments that we were talking about? Because I still feel the same way that this is a good bill for the public. It's a, it's a bill where uh, the concerns of that CSLB addressed. Um, and I kind of went back to the minutes and I kind of remember that we did vote as a support if amended. So maybe Fawn, if you could let me know and understand which parts of the amendments weren't done by the, the sponsor. Well, we were hoping at the time we were hoping to establish the consumer protection value this would provide. Um, that did not happen. Um, they didn't address that in amendments. And with the fiscal, you know, this is just a staff recommendation to remain neutral on this. But of course, if the board feels this bill provides value, we could certainly support it. Or we could communicate your support, sorry. This is board member Tykert. It strikes me that the intention of the bill is just as board member Mark described in terms of making these things more transparent and available, um, but also the effect of it feels somewhat limited. So if we're only gonna report three possibly incorrect codes, feels to me like, and we're gonna spend a quarter of a million dollars doing that. And we're not even at our four to five months in reserve that we want from a budgetary standpoint. It's hard to see that that's gonna create a bunch of value. So I feel like for me, neutral at best seems sufficient. It's also not that we're the only source of this information. My understanding is this comes from the insurance. Yeah, the, the statistical agents for the uh, offering Department of Insurance is the Workers' Compensation Insurance Rating Bureau. So one would think they would have this information, but they don't, if they do have it, they're not publicizing and they would prefer that we do. So that's, kind of, that's my understanding. So the other, that, cause that's my other piece is I feel like the CSLB is super responsible and takes on a lot of responsibility for contractors. And also there's other state agencies that have jobs to do. And so Department of Insurance can do, has a role to play here as well. So it's, I would, I would stick with neutral personally would be my thought. Uh, as a follow up on that, um, the, myself, my, as a contractor, I currently have 10 codes. So which three of the 10 do I put? And does that expose me to some type of liability? And there are a lot of contractors that have more than three coats. Uh, and, and so trying to decide uh, which ones to put down may be problematic. And, and for that, uh, I certainly uh, concur that we should stay neutral on this until that's figured out. Any other board comments or questions? Michael. So in that, I believe that's why they amended the bill to make make it from the concerns of the board that limited it only to the three. And to my understanding, it's going to be the top three from just from what I'm reading here. Um, in the end, our board serves the public. And obviously there is fiscal impact for anything that's done for the public needs, right? In, in my opinion, I, I think sometimes, and, and you hear a lot about workers comp, workers comp issues, um, and I think from here, what the, from the fact sheet that I read here, or just the information that was provided, that could be a perfect case where uh, a, a contractor is doing the right thing, paying the proper workers' comp code for, let's say, a roofing contractor paying for a roofer's workers' comp, but they're actually paying for, let's say, office staff instead of their employees. So that's, in, in my opinion, that's good for the public to know and understand which where they're at in, on that value. Um, if, if we're looking for a motion, I would make a motion to change our staff recommendation to support for this bill. So um, would we, um, Mike, would we entertain the original motion and then uh, entertain a second motion or how would we proceed? Yeah, if, uh, uh, well, do you want the board member makes a motion, we can vote on the motion. 
Okay, is that right? So that so that is the the uh, the current motion on the floor is to take an affirmative. Is that in my understanding? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Michael Mark make the motion to that we change our staff position from neutral to support of this bill. Is there a second on that motion? I second it, Johnny. Johnny Simpson, I second it. Okay. Um, Mar uh, Mariah, uh, uh, are there? Um, do I need to speak to take public yeah, comment? Room for comment. Yeah, let's let's have a public comment and or, or Jim, remote comment first. I think I'd like to add a comment too. I think your point that they amended the bill is certainly true. I just don't think the amendments went far enough because one of the things we wanted was some demonstration of value. So to the point about there's 10 codes, I mean, we probably have 50, mm -hmm. but so which one was left off? Were those the top three or the right ones? Creates questions without creating value because there might be a valid code within the set that we have that's not reflected in the top three and therefore doesn't connect to whatever insurance topic they've got. And now the CSLB is involved in it instead of just the license board. So I feel like the demonstration of value wasn't there. I think the intent is cool, but um, as far as our role in the implementation of it, I don't think the amendments captured what we would need, which is a super valuable thing for the public. Because I think we would happily pay, you know, even the original tab of a million dollars for site updates if we thought this was totally valuable for the public. So that's my 10 cents on whether this is going to accomplish the goal that we are trying to look at here. Mariah, is there, oh, excuse me, Johnny. Uh, for, for, for my 10 cents, and I, this has always been an issue within the construction industry and, you know, finding some solve to this is, I mean, I'm glad we're on the track that eventually everyone's going to have workers comp and, and that sort of thing. But at the same time, you know, good contractors have lost jobs over workers comp issues. Um, you know, we have to find some sort of solution to this. Even if we're just posting on our website the different codes, what they should be carrying. I mean, we've got it. This is a major issue within our industry. So that's my two cents. Thank you, John. Anyone else on the board? Public comment, uh, Mariah or uh, Rico? We have a public comment from Mario Wilson. Mario, I've sent you a request to unmute and you have three minutes to speak. My name is Mario Wilson and I represent Western Steel Council, the largest employer association that is signatory to the District Council of Ironworkers. We represent over 50 companies that account for 80% of all the association's hours and do close to a billion dollars worth of work every year in California. We know that contractors that play by the rules are undercut by unscrupulous contractors that misclassify. These classification codes will allow our companies a fair shot during the bidding process and make sure that workers are protected. Publishing the classification codes linked to a contractor's policy enables awarding bodies and enforcement agencies to verify if companies bidding on a project comply with the appropriate workers' compensation rates for their employees. This increased transparency will lead to less stress on the state workers' compensation fund. The Western Steel Council requests a support position from the board members of the Contractor State License Board on bill number AB336. Thank you everyone for your time today. Thank you. Rico, anyone else? No further public comment. Uh, board member Guy. Yeah, I would. Um... I think in terms of a contractor, it's important to report these codes. I would agree that this is probably more of a, a workers' comp and Department of Insurance. In terms of this board for consumer protection, I don't see how workers' comp codes being displayed on the contractor state license board is going to help protect the consumers. That's my two bits. Thank you. Seeing no more comment, um, I'll go ahead and uh, reaffirm the motion to support Oh, we have one more public comment. Thank you, Rico. Coming in from um, Mitchell. And Mitchell, I have sent a request to unmute. And you, can, you have three minutes to speak. Go ahead, Mitchell. All right, so 
you know, AB 336, the bill speaks directly to this misclassification of workers. Um, when contractors misclassify during that bid process, uh, they get an unfair advantage compared to every other contractor that's bidding for that scope of work. Um, so we tried to address this by having all of the classification codes listed. Um, staff's recommendations were to slim that down to account for the fiscal um, cost. You know, we, we worked with CSLB over the last two cycles uh, to get this over the finish line and to get a support position from you guys. We've accepted all, or the author rather, has accepted all of the proposed amendments from you. Um, this is a one-time fiscal cost, and it's going to allow both enforcement agencies and awarding bodies to be able to actually look at what rates a company or contractor is actually paying workman's compensation for during that bid process. So they get a real-time update of what's happening. Um, it allows them you know, that transparency so that we can be awarding honest contractors that do good work and employ uh, good people to be able to get those jobs comparatively to bad actors who are you know, undermining the system and misclassifying workers across the state. Um, so again, the fiscal cost is a one-time fee for a lifetime of transparency. Um, you know, we would ask from the district council's perspective that you take a support position and we appreciate your guys' work on this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rico? No further public comment. Thank you. With that, to reaffirm the motion to support and the second from uh, Johnny Simpson. Um, Mariah, would you roll, uh, do roll, please? Mary Tykert? No. Rodney Cobos, approved absence. David De La Torre? Aye. Miguel Galarza? Nay. Amanda Gallo? No. Alan Guy? No. Susan Granzella? No. Jacob Lopez? Aye. Diana Love? No. Michael Mark? Aye. Stephen Pinelli approved absence. Jim Ruane? No. Johnny Simpson? Aye. Motion does not pass. Um, would it be appropriate to take uh, another vote based on staff recommendation? May I make a motion for a neutral position? Please, Stag. So moved. I'll second. Oh, okay. Thank you. So with that, uh, is there a public comment on that item and that motion? Uh, not that we can see now. However, the WebEx application is apparently not displaying raised hands properly. So I'd like to request that anyone who does have comment for the public comment section of the rest of this meeting to please use our chat feature. I don't see any other public comments. Enrico? Until you, if you get something in the chat. There's nothing coming in the chat now. Thank you. Thank you, Rico. With that, Mariah, would you call roll? Mary Tykert? Aye. Rodney Cobos, approved absence. David De La Torre? Aye. Miguel Galarza? Aye. Amanda Gallo? Aye. Alan Guy? Aye. Susan Granzella? Aye. Jacob Lopez? Aye. Diana Love? Aye. Michael Mark? Aye. Stephen Pinelli, approved absence. Jim Ruane? Aye. Johnny Simpson? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Mariah. Uh, the next bill to be represented on the agenda item is item E2.B, AB 968 by Assemblymember Grayson, which begins on page 90, excuse me, 79 of your packet. This bill would require sellers of property purchased within the previous 18 months to disclose to the new buyer any room additions, modifications, or alterations made to the property and turned over to the buyer all permits obtained for the work performed. 
This bill would require sellers to disclose the name and contact information of any contractor who performed the work additions, modifications, or alterations. Lana, would you be so kind as to summarize AB 968? Thank you, Chair Galarza. This bill is intended to address house flippers. Um, consequently, this bill applies to sellers who sell a property within 18 months of buying the property. When selling a property, the Department of or any Department of Real Estate licensee must currently complete a list of disclosures. Among those are whether room additions, modifications, or alterations were completed without complying with building codes and to provide an explanation. This bill would add to those disclosures exactly what modifications were made, the name and contact information of the contractor who did the work, and it would require the seller to turn over the permits that were obtained to complete that work. Based on technical assistance from staff, this bill was amended to apply to any contractor regardless of license status or if they have an owner builder exemption and require, okay, yeah, um, if they have an owner builder exemption, this bill would also apply to them as well. This bill increases, increases transparency and disclosures to buyers of flip property, encourages contracting with licensed contractors, and will increase the likelihood of sellers obtaining permits and complying with California building codes. So for these reasons, staff are recommend, re recommending a support position. This bill is currently on second reading on the Senate floor. After the floor vote, it would go back to the assembly for concurrence vote on the amendments taken after CSLB's technical assistance. From there, it would go to the governor. And I give it back to Chair, Legislative Chair Galarza. Thank you, Fana. As, as so noted, the staff recommends the support on this bill. Do I have a motion? So moved. Thank Second. You. Exactly. I'd like to pause briefly and introduce Rodney Kobos, who's joined us online. So we now have one additional board member present. Thank so you. Include him in our call. Yeah. So to uh, confirm, it's a, a affirmative from uh, Chair Tigert and David Tellatori. Second. Yes. Thank you. Uh, any board members who would like to have a comment? Yes, I have a question and a comment. Yes. Um, love. I want to know. I know this legislation. Are the will the contracts be upgraded or amended from escrow and different things like that? To, and to make sure that this is in there when the buyers sign. Anna, did you hear that? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Michael. No, you do it. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you rephrase? If, if, if this is going to be something that is required when the, that the sellers disclose, is that going to be in the contract that the buyers sign that they know that it's there? Yes, the disclosure form is part of the contract when the property is sold. So it's a mandated part of the contract anytime um, a property is sold. And how does that affect an owner that sells their property and doesn't go through um, the legal the ways that we do things sometimes? Sometimes it's owner sold. Are they obligated to sell? Will they be obligated as well? And will that be a part of the bill? Yes, this would also apply to them. It would apply to any seller, whether it's a licensee of the Department of Real Estate or if the owner is selling the property themselves. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Registered folk, would you have a comment? Thank you. Um, anyone, uh, any members uh, remote? Uh, if not, uh, any public comment on this item? Rico. No public comment on this item. Very good. Uh, with that, uh, Mariah, would you please uh, be so kind as to call roll? Mary Tykert? Aye. Rodney Kobos? Aye. David De La Torre? Aye. Miguel Galarza? Aye. Amanda Gallo? Aye. Alan Guy? Aye. Susan Granzella? Aye. Jacob Lopez? Aye. Diana Love? Aye. Michael Mark? Aye. 
Stephen Pinelli, approved absence. Jim Ruane. Aye. Johnny Simpson. Aye. Motion passes. The next bill on the agenda is item 2.2C, AD 1204, from the same number, starting on page 162. Oh, thank you. 162 of your packet. This bill would prohibit contractors under specific circumstances from subcontracting with two or more contractors in the same classification on the same job site. This bill would make a violation of this section cause for disciplinary action according to the author's fact sheet. This bill is intended to prevent contractors from misclassifying employees as some contractors to avoid complying with workman's compensation requirements. Fana will present the review of this bill. Thank you. AB 1204 was presented in March and the board decided to watch the bill to give sponsors a, a chance to address board concerns. At the time, the bill would have pro prohibited a contractor from subcontracting to a sub unless the sub had employees. The bill also did not specify when this prohibition would apply. Staff worked with the Assembly Committee on Business and Professions to provide technical assistance to the sponsors of AB 1204. And the bill was subsequently amended on April 27th to specify that a specialty contractor would be prohibited. So it's, it changes the bill to a specialty contractor before it just said contractor. So um, the specialty contractor would be prohibited from subcontract <laughs> subcontracting to a contractor in the same specialty, unless that sub has employees. Additionally, the bill was amended to make clear the supplies to a single project or undertaking. This bill was introduced to address employee misclassification, which is not enforced by CSLB. Additionally, the consumer protection value of this bill is still undetermined because lack of workers' compensation insurance which actually would impact consumers is addressed, was addressed by SB 216 last year. So although staff questioned the value added by this bill, the sponsors were willing to accept amendments to address board concerns. This bill does not carry a fiscal, so staff are recommending that the board take a neutral position on this bill. This bill passed the Assembly Committee on Business and Professions on June 19th and will be heard by the Committee on Labor, Public Employees and Retirement but a hearing date has not been set as of this morning. Back to Chair Galarza. Thank you, Fauna. Um, the current staff recommendation on this bill, as noted, is neutral. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you, Susan. Uh, is second. there a second? I'll second. Thank Diana you. Love. Thank you, Ms. Love. Um, Board members, are, are there any board members with comments on this item? Uh, any remote board members with comments? I'd like to share my, my thoughts on this item and, and why I believe that a neutral is appropriate at this time. There are many uh, public works contractors that mentor small businesses. Uh, there are large contractors that do structural concrete work, and, and that is a specialty trade. They're doing foundations, structural modifications to buildings. And then there are contractors to do flat work or do sidewalk work, same classification, much smaller contractor. That would prohibit a, a large prime contractor from breaking out sections of the work to support the small business community, which I believe is not the intent, but would uh, cast aside uh, any large business that was trying to create opportunities for small business. I believe this is uh, a faulty resolution. And in addition to that, I clearly understand that workman's comp is the issue. But in a few years or next year, I believe, all contractors, regardless of their size and how many people they have, will be required to have workman's comp. So therefore, I, uh, I support, and this is one of the primary reasons why I support this as a neutral position at this time. Um, are there any public comments, um, Rico? No public comments. All right. Well, um, with that, um, I would go ahead and um, ask Mariah to, to call roll, please. Okay. 
Can I just clarify? So is the motion neutral? Yes, the motion is to, to proceed with the neutral. Thank you. Mary Teichert? Aye. Rodney Cobos? Aye. David De La Torre? Aye. Miguel Galarza? Aye. Amanda Gallo? Aye. Alan Guy? Aye. Susan Granzella? Aye. Jacob Lopez? Aye. Diana Love? Aye. Michael Mark? Aye. Stephen Pinelli approved absence. Jim Ruane? Aye. Johnny Simpson? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Mariah. I'd now like to turn to the next agenda item, which is E2D AB 1383 by Assemblyman Ortega, which is on page 83 of your booklet. This bill is no longer moving, so there is not a full analysis in this meeting material. The bill would have imposed a reporting requirement for licensees and CSLB to assess licensees who are not in compliance with child support orders. The Department of Consumer Affairs and the Department of Child Support Services have a long-standing interagency agreement to enforce these cases. The agreement created a system comprised of automatic processing where the Department of Child, Service, uh, Child Protective Services is the enforcement entity. Based on the system already in place, the author removed the bill from consideration before it was heard by committee. Because of, because of this bill is presently and an update only, a motion is not required. Are, are there any board members that like to discuss this item? Any remote board members that like to discuss this item? Rico, is there anyone in the public that like to discuss this item? No public comment. Thank you, Rico. Uh, the next agenda item would be E2E, and which is SB 544 by uh, Senator Lard, which begins on page 84. This bill would make multiple changes to implement a permanent remote meeting option that would be allowable under the Begley Clean Open Meetings Act. Fauna, would you be so kind as to provide uh, the basis of this uh, bill and a summary. Absolutely. Thank you. SB 544 would codify temporary executive orders and laws that allowed state bodies to hold remote meetings over the past couple of years. SB 544 would permanently adopt a remote meeting option so long as the board provides the public with a means to hear audio of the meetings. The board provides a way the public can remotely observe the meeting. The board includes a method to access the meeting remotely, whether conference call or online platform, and that that, um, that process is posted on the agenda. The board provides at least one physical site, which is also listed on the agenda. The board implements and advertises a procedure to meet accessibility requirements. And that board members who are participating remotely, if they have any uh, members of the public who are 18 years of age or older at that location, they need to let the name of that person be known and describe the general nature of the relationship with the individual. That wouldn't be on the agenda, but that would be announced during the meeting. Um, this bill does not include an, an urgency clause. So that means this bill would not take effect until January 1st if adopted as it is currently in, in print. Um, that would require our next two board meetings to comply with the requirements of Bagley Keene to hold in-person meetings. So we would go back to the system it was before um, COVID. Although not effective immediately, this bill would provide flexibility in meeting scheduling, increase the opportunity for public participation, and increase the pool of people who, would, who might be willing to serve as a board member. So staff is recommending that the board support this bill. If a support position is taken, staff also request authority to work with the legislative committee chair to continue to support this bill if amended, so long as the concept of permissive remote meetings remains the focal point of the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Fauna. Is there a motion uh, to take staff recommendation to support? I'll make the motion. 
Diane Thank Oldman. You. Thank you, Ms. Love. Second. Thank you, Mary. Um, is there a public, is there a board meeting that like to discuss this item? Anyone on the board? I do have a question. How is it that the official sponsor is the California Commission on Aging? Uh, I mean, how what, was it just random or are they representing the interests of aging? You know, um, just Mike, I, uh, Deputy, where to start? You could answer that. I'm not sure why they sponsored the legislation, but, you know, a lot of programs statewide are happy that they did. I I would guess that, you know, a lot of public agencies have these meetings and they might have determined the benefit of these flexibilities. And so, and I don't know that commission, but they, they might have been particularly interested in the concept. Johnny. You know, came bag has been around for a while, and there was a very good reason that it's been around for a while. You know, I I personally feel like uh, you know we had an emergency with COVID and, and all of those things, but you know, public meetings are important. You should you should be proud of your vote, and you should face the public when you have your vote. So, um, you know, I. I too benefited. I mean, I was president when uh, when we had COVID, so we had remote meetings, and uh, I was glad for it. But we can always do it through an emergency. I personally don't support this, so just say it. Thank you, Member Simpson. Uh, any remote comments from the board? Yeah, any through the chair, chair. Through the chair, if I may, Jim or Wayne, this is very similar to what the, the Brown Act is is uh, is doing for other meetings. I had a meeting a week ago and I couldn't attend. I had to tell them where I was, who was in the room, over 18. It's it's just a parallel to the Brown Act is what it is. So, Thank you, Jim. Rico, is there any public comment? No public comment. Thank you, sir. With that, Mariah, would you be so kind as to take a roll? Mary Teichert? Aye. Ronnie Kobos? Aye. David De La Torre? Aye. Miguel Galarza? Aye. Amanda Gallo? Aye. Alan Guy? Aye. Susan Granzella? Aye. Jacob Lopez? Aye. Diana Love? Aye. Michael Mark? Aye. Stephen Pinelli approved absence. Jim Ruane? Aye. Johnny Simpson? No. Motion passes. Thank you, Mariah. The next bill is SB 601 by Senator McGuire, which begins on your packet uh, eight on A86. This bill is a result of the legislative proposal we discussed at the board meeting on March 21st, 2023. After the board meeting, staff provided the legislative proposal to the author and it was introduced as AB 601 the next day. This bill will increase the statutory limits of, of misdemeanor violations uh, pertaining to unlawful use of a license. Additionally, this bill would increase the civil penalties for home improvement contract violations, which are committed in a declared disaster area. Bonnie, would you be so kind as to summarize AB, excuse me, SB 601? Yes, so SB 601 was discussed at the March board meeting and approved as a legislative proposal. Um, shortly thereafter, it was introduced as a bill authored by Senator McGuire. That proposal originally would have included new payment and performance bond requirements in declared disaster areas. However, after finding out the surety industry had no appetite for underwriting these bonds, the bill was amended to instead include language to increase the civil penalties for home improvement contract violations in declared disaster areas. These violations include failure to execute a written contract with a contract price stated on it, as well as excessive down payment and progress payment practices, which contribute to inferior workmanship and job abandonment in these areas. 
The bill would increase the civil penalty range for misdemeanor violations from $100 to $5,000 to the new range of $5,000 to $15,000 in declared disaster areas. By increasing the statute of limitations for misdemeanor violations of license use laws and increasing fines in disaster areas, this bill increases CSLB's ability to investigate and take appropriate action when consumers who are already victim of a disaster are taken advantage of by unscrupulous contractors. This bill was heard on Tuesday by the Assembly Committee on Business and Professions and unanimously passed. In fact, this bill has been heard by three policy committees, the Appropriations Committee the Senate and the Senate floor, and has not received a single no vote. Staff recommend the board support this bill. Um, although we are not an official sponsor, we are partnered with Senator McGuire to um, provide primary testimony in support of the bill and provide language and information that they need to get it through. Um, the current status is this bill passed Assembly BMP and will be scheduled for hearing by the Committee on Public Safety next. Thank you. Thank you, Fana. Is there a motion? Uh, All motion. Second. Thank you, Alan. And who's second? Jim Ruane. Thank you, Jim. Uh, board members, any comments on this item? I had one question. Who gets the five thousand dollars? <laughs> the local jurisdiction does. These are for misdemeanor violations, so it would be the prosecuting county. Okay, I was hoping CSLB get a piece of that. <laughs> All right. Uh, any any other board members with comments? Uh, remote members. Um, Rico. Any um, members of the public? No public comment. Thank you, sir. With that, Mariah, would you be so kind? Mary Tykert? Aye. Rodney Cobos? Aye. David De La Torre? Aye. Miguel Galarza? Aye. Amanda Gallo? Aye. Alan Guy? Aye. Susan Granzella? Aye. Jacob Lopez? Aye. Diana Love? Aye. Michael Mark? Aye. Stephen Pinelli, approved absence. Jim Ruane? Aye. Johnny Simpson? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Mariah. The final pending bill on the legislative agenda is SB 630 by Senator Dodd, which begins on page 88 of your packet. This bill would require CSLB licensees to provide an email to CSLB at the time of initial licensure and renewal and update the email address within 30 days of the change. This bill would, would protect email address confidentiality by establishing that licensee email addresses are exempt from disclosure under the California Public Records Act. Finally, this bill would codify the standardize the registers authority authorization to revoke a license for failing to comply with uh, probationary conditions. Fana, would you please be so kind as to provide an update on SB 630? Yes, so this CSLB sponsored bill was also discussed at the March board meeting and the board voted to support this bill. Like SB 601, this bill was heard on Tuesday by the Assembly Committee on Business and Professions and unanimously passed. It has also gone through the legislative process without receiving a no vote so far. SB 630 is scheduled for hearing in the Assembly Committee on Judiciary next Tuesday, June 27th. Um, because this bill has not been amended, the support position previously taken stands, and this is only presented as an update. So I'll turn it back to Legislative Chair Galarza. Thank you, Fona, for that clarification. Since again, as stated in the March board meeting, the board uh, supported this. There is no additional amendments. And so uh, there is no motion is required at this time. Uh, nevertheless, are there any board members with comments? 
I have a I have a question. Does this mean and I looked through this and I didn't see it. Does this mean their email address will be displayed on the website on our website? That would be no. Sorry, the language of this bill would protect uh, licensee email addresses from disclosure. Thank you. Thank you. Remote comments from board members. Rico, are there any public comments? No public comment. Thank you, Rico. No, well, we'll now go on to uh, our next agenda item, which is E3, review, discussion, and possible action item on amendments to business and professional codes, section 7071.4, to address board exposure to risk of liability for attorney's fees in legislation involving a deposit in lieu of bond. Uh, Carton versus RE Design and Construction. Based on a decision in Carton versus RE Design and Construction, CSLB would be exposed to financial liabilities for attorney's fees in all future cash deposit civil cases. The board was recently named as a co-defendant in a consumer versus contractor civil suit involving a deposit of lieu of bond. In this case, the CSLB is liable for more than $100,000 and attorney's fees. To address this recent development, staff are proposing amendments to the Business and Professional Code, Section 7071.4. The proposal would clarify that CSLB should not be responsible for attorney's fees. In this case, Fana, would you be so kind as to provide uh, a, an update on and a background on this item? Thank you. Business and Professions Code Section 7071.4 allows licensees who do not wish to file a bond acquired through a surety to make a deposit with CSLB in lieu of the bond. Subdivision G of that same section prohibits payment from any bond alternative filed with a registrar to be released as unless as determined by the court. So in other words, we need a court order in order to make payment on that bond. In those cases, CSLB would be named as a co-defendant. In circumstances where instead of a bond, the contractor makes a deposit with CSLB, the law treats CSLB as a surety. So in the Carton case, this was a civil dispute between a consumer and a contractor. The court found the surety was liable for attorney fees. This case set the precedent that sureties and in the case of cash deposits, that would be CSLB. The sureties may be responsible for paying attorney fees. Uh, currently, CSLB is named in a case where we could re be responsible for hundreds of thousands of dollars in attorney fees in a $25,000 bond case um, where we were just as required by law waiting for the judgment so we could release the bond. So this legislative proposal would ensure CSLB is not responsible for legal fees associated with any civil action where a cash deposit in lieu of bond is made. Staff are requesting the approval to share this proposal with members of the legislature to seek an author. If it's too late to find an author, staff then request approval to include this proposal as a new issue in the sunset report. And I'll turn it back to Chair, Legislative Chair Galarza. If I may add, this is John Kinn, if I may add to Fauna's comments, the appellate court ruled that in that case that a party who aggressively defended rather than released um, should be slapped and they were slapped hard. Um, and there's no allegation that CSLB has done anything in any of these cases other than the right thing, which is um, come into court as they are sued. Um, and there is a new procedure now that CSLB has advised and have been accepted by the DAGs who are representing us in these cases where we're nominal defendants sitting there with a small bag of cash, um, that that cash by court procedure be as soon as possible at the first opportunity um, deposited with the court by a court determination under the statute of 7071.4. Um, and I've seen one of those motions already and it's been successful. So hopefully the exposure will be limited, but in addition to this subsection that doesn't, it prohibits us as a board from charging any money against those, uh, the money we're holding on deposit in lieu of bond, why not add a section uh, that caps our liability at the amount of the bond? 
Thank you. Sorry, Fauna. No, I appreciate the the addition. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so therefore, a, a, the staff is recommending a support on this item. Do we have a motion from the board? Johnny Simpson, I'd make that motion. Thank you, Chair. Second. Um, Johnny. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dean. Um, are there any board members in the room that'd like to make comment on this item? Go ahead. Do we have an idea of how many cash deposits we have percentage-wise versus bonds in place for licenses? I believe Mike pulled data. Um, Mike, do you remember how many we have? There, uh, we have to scroll through the data to get a perfect number because they all have different statutory retention time periods. Um, long story short, there are there are many, but um, statistically over the years, only about 10 of these get to court and get pled. So as far as our liability, our exposure for this carton case, it might be about 10 cases a year. There are a lot of cash deposits still on file. Some some contractors never got rid of them. They disappeared, they expired. We're trying to, it's, it's very complicated, but our liability is only about 10 cases a year. Thank you. Any other members with comments? Remote members? Uh, Rico, are there anyone in, in the public that would like to make a comment on this item? No public comment. Thank you, Rico. Mariah, would you be so kind? Mary Teichert? Aye. Rodney Kobos? Aye. David De La Torre? Aye. Miguel Galarza? Aye. Amanda Gallo? Aye. Alan Guy? Aye. Susan Granzella? Aye. Jacob Lopez? Aye. Diana Love? Aye. Michael Mark? Aye. Stephen Pinelli, approved absence. Jim Ruane? Aye. Johnny Simpson? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Mariah. We now move on to section E4, regulations. Staff has two regulations to present. The first is of those is agenda item E.4A, reviewing discussion and possible action on Sprinkler Fitters Association of California petition pursuant to government's code section 1134.0.6 and 1134.0.7 to amend section 832.16 of Title 16, Division 8, Article 3 of the California Code of Regulations, C-16 Fire Protection Contractors Classification to include fire fighter air replenishment systems, which begins on page 99 of your booklet. Still so should be received a petition for the adoption of regulations dated on May 11th, 2023, from the Sprinkler Fitters Association of California, which can be found on pages 102 and 103 of your booklet. The petition requests an amendment to the California Code of Regulations, section 832.16, which describes the scope of C-16 fire protection contribution. The petition would add FARs in installations to work that would be performed under C-16 classification. Council John Clinn, would present the details, uh, items concerning this petition. John, feel free. Thank you, Chair Galarza. The, uh, the petition letter and the um, applicable design and tech uh, of a, Appendix L, as it's referred to in your packet, are, are in the packet. Um, the board received this petition letter under the Administrative Procedures Act. Um, asking for additional language in the classification of C-16 fire protection contractors um, without really an explanation other than that the language is not currently in any regulation on um, with the CCR. The petition process to amend a regulation under the APA is an extraordinarily rare event for the board. Um, and so my explanation is unfortunately a little longer than I would prefer, but um, I'll go as fast as I can. And the board looks to this petition letter to uncover a rationale or effect um, of the proposed amendment. And in the petition process, 
the board hasn't undertaken the usual um, reaching out to contractors and other classifications who perform this FARS work, um, such as the, the C36 plumbing contractors, um, nor has the board um, had a chance to thoroughly scour building officials for comments and the effect uh, of this proposed language. Um, so I'll start with the petition itself. Um, it references the International Fire Code in this Appendix L, which is on pages 104 and 105, um, the design and install requirements for FAS. Um, the petition uh, does not, it correctly states that there's no current regulation language that defines who may install or repair FARS in California. Um, the petition concludes that the most qualified to install piping and system components in FARS is the class of C-16 fire protection contractors. Uh, it's important to note that C-36 plumbing contractor classification performs work which is generally described by the FARS technology. Um, the petition goes on to state that the Office of the State Fire Marshal has not adopted this Appendix L statewide but that certain local jurisdictions have. Um, however, state fire marshal regulations do not identify any CSLB license classification um, that's to perform this work. And classification determination, as you all know, is solely within the authority of CSLB. Other than describing the technology and stating that Appendix L is codified, in some building codes and not others, the petition doesn't address why the amendments to this regulation are warranted. The petition does not provide evidence of the necessity for the proposed amendment, despite having opportunities to do so. Again, petitions to amend are extremely rare. Um, regulations must be approved by the Office of Administrative Law under the APA standards and procedures. Um, as a good practice under the APA, agencies typically begin the regular rulemaking process with a concept. And the agency then encourages stakeholders to participate, to discuss, and clearly outline the need or rationale for a proposed action. This process will ensure and does ensure that mandates and standards of the APA are met and will be met by any proposal from the board. This is the preferred and most common method as it allows the board to work out any issues before initiating an official rulemaking process. Um, the petition process being used in this case um, does not include any of these usual preparations. And the petition under the Administrative Procedure Act must include three things. One is the substance of the regulation the reason for the request and the reference to our authority as a board to take action. The APA also provides this agency with the authority to either grant or deny the petition in whole or in part based on the merits of the information received in the um, letter petition. Government code section 11340.7, which concludes this petition process also provides a means for interested parties to request reconsideration of any board decision, and the request must contain reasons why the board should reconsider the initial decision and the agency should make a decision based on the merits of the request. The board in the letter petition does not have all the information showing the necessity, benefits, or consequences to the other classifications set forth in regulation. The petition presented in this case does not pro provide evidence or any explanation for how the proposal would benefit and protect the public, which is, as we, again, we all know is of the highest priority for this board. Staff has recommended a denial of the petition on the merits um, submitted in this brief letter and denial of the petition will not prevent the board from considering this subject on future agenda items or on future dates. So they, Thank you, John. Chair, are you going to go through the two options under the statute? Um, these two? Yes. Um, yes. I, I can. Yeah, I'll summarize it again. Please Thank do. You, John. Those are the two options for a motion from the board. 
So as John stated, there are two options. And the first option is, is the staff recommends to deny the petition received from the Sprinkler Fitters Association of California dated May 11th, uh, 2023, requesting to amend the CR, CCR section 832.16 in whole is made based on the merits of the petition according with the Administrative Procedure Act. Um, the information contained in the petition does not demonstrate or provide substantial evidence that the proposal is warranted. Such information supporting the petition be received. The board may reconsider in discussion with the stakeholders and public discussion at future board meetings. There appears to be some piece that I'm missing. No, you're you're okay. That's just the staff recommendation from the bottom of yes. so page 101, but there are a couple options that the board can consider. Um, I don't I don't know if I see that in this. I it appears I think. Okay, thank you. All right. I'm back on track. Option one. If the board agrees with staff recommendations to deny the petitions as presented in the meeting materials, the board may take the following actions. Deny the petition based on the grounds set forth in the meeting materials and other grounds raised at the meeting and transmit the denial to the Office of Administrative Law within 30 days. That is option one. Option two is if the board approves the petition and considers the proposal text acceptable as presented in the meeting materials, the board may take the following actions. Grant the petition, approve the proposed regulations text and changes to section 832.16 as provided in the material and direct staff to submit all approved text to the director, director of the Department of Consumer Affairs and Business Consumer Services and Housing Agencies for review. If no adverse comments are received, authorized, register to take all steps necessary to initiate the rulemaking process, make any non-substantive changes to the packet, and schedule the matter for public hearing. If no adverse comments are received within 45-day comment period or at the hearing, authorize, register to take all steps necessary to complete the rulemaking and adopt the proposed amendments to section 832.16 as noted. We have two options. Given that, I believe we would want to take a motion for option one. I make a motion to adopt the staff recommendation. Do I have a second? Second. Yes. Thank you, Bjarni. With that, are, are there any comments on taking staff's recommendation? Remote comments? Rico, are there any public comments? No public comments. This is Rodney Cobos. Hey, Rodney, go ahead. Yeah, can you, can you repeat the option again? The long one or the short one? <laughs> the short one. Option one, all right. In the board, if the board agrees with staff's recommendation to deny the petition as presented in the meeting materials, the board may take the following actions. Deny the petition based on the grounds set forth in the meeting material and other grounds raised at the meeting and transmit the denial to the Office of the Administrative Law within 30 days. That is option one. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. Does that answer your question, board member Jim? Oh, I'm sorry, Rodney Kobos? Yeah, so option, just so I can be clear, on option two, it, it allows the petition to come back if they if they provide more information. No, op option two is to well, is, approve the petition as presented and immediately send to rulemaking. Which we don't have any supporting documentation for. That's what option two would be. Understood. Thank you. And my understanding is there's nothing that would preclude the petitioner from getting a better case together and coming back again. 
Thank you, Barry. That's what I was trying to get to. Thank you. Sorry about that. I didn't realize it turned that off. Uh, are there any um, further comments? We do have public comment. Is there a public comment? Rico? Yes, Richard Markison, I just sent you a request to unmute. You have three minutes to speak. Good afternoon, uh, board members. Uh, I'm Richard Markison uh, speaking to you today on behalf of the Plumbing, Heating, Cooling Contractors of California and the California chapters of the American Fire Sprinkler Association. Uh, without uh, commenting on the substance of the uh, proposal, uh, we would certainly support the staff recommendation and both organizations would certainly commit to working with both the um, uh, Sprinkler Fitters Association as, uh, and with CSLB staff uh, to uh, better understand the proposal uh, and would work, work with all interested parties in the event they uh, decided to move forward with this proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Rico, any other further comments? Public. No further public comment. Thank you, Rico. With that, Mariah, would you please uh, call roll? Mary Teichert? Aye. Rodney Cobos? Aye. David De La Torre? Aye. Miguel Galarza? Aye. Amanda Gallo? Aye. Alan Guy? Aye. Susan Granzella? Aye. Jacob Lopez? Aye. Diana Love? Aye. Michael Mark? Aye. Stephen Pinelli, approved absence. Jim Ruane? Aye. Johnny Simpson? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Mariah. The final legislative agenda item is item E, 4.B, review and discussion and possible action on section 100, rulemaking proposal to raise the fine Maximus to conform to business and professional code section 7099.2. And that begins on page 106 of your pamphlet. In this item, staff requests board approval to engage in the rulemaking process to make non substantive regulatory changes. The proposal would amend California Code Regulations section 884 to raise the maximum civil penalties for certain violations of the contractor state license law. I would refer to Fauna to provide additional information on this proposal. Thank you. Business and Professions Code Section 7110 establishes that a contractor's willful or deliberate disregard for state and local building permit laws is a violation of the contractor state license law. Last year, Assembly Bill 1747 by Assemblymember Cork added Section 7110 to the list of violations for which a maximum penalty can be up to $30,000. Staff are requesting authorization to initiate the rulemaking process to amend Section um, Title 16, Section 884 in our regulations which sets fines. Um, these changes would conform to 1747 by updating the maximum fine amounts through the Section 100 process. So proposals made under the Section 100 rule allows amendments to be made without being subject to the notice and 45 day public comment period um, as required by substantive rulemakings in the Administrative Procedure Act. This rulemaking would be considered technical, non-substantive, and without regulatory effect, as it would make Section 884 in our regulations consistent with the amendment statute. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Fana. Um, is there a motion? Make the motion, Michael Mark. Michael? I'll Thank you. second. And uh, Mary Tigert, second? Susan, yeah. So noted. Uh, are there any members on the board that would like to make additional comments on this item? All remote members? I hate to do this to everybody, but we're going to read the elongated staff recommendation and then see if there's an motion to adopt the staff recommendation. 
Reading on. And it goes as follows. The staff recommendation is to, to approve the proposed regulation text for CCR section 88.4, authorizing the register to take all steps necessary to pursue the rulemaking through the CCR section 100 procedure. The authorized staff to make non-substantive changes to the text and or rulemaking package as needed through the process. Altern alternatively, if deemed necessary by the Department of Consumer Affairs or the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency, initiate the rulemaking process, making any non-substantive changes to the text and or rulemaking package as needed through the process. And if approved by the Department of Consumer Affairs and the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agencies, set the matter for the hearing if preferred or requested. If no adverse comments are received during the 45 day comment period, authorize register to adopt the proposed regulations to CCR section 88.4 as filed with the Office of Administrative Law for the public notice and take all steps necessary to complete the rulemaking process, making any non-substantive changes to the text and or rulemaking package as needed throughout the process. Uh, with that, are there any other comments from the public or from the board? Is there a motion to adopt that staff recommendation? Or motion to adopt the staff recommendation as presented. Michael Mark. Second. With that, in, uh, Rico, one last time for the public. No public comment. Thank you. Um, Mariah, would you be so kind as to call roll? Mary Tyker. Aye. Rodney Cobos. Aye. David De La Torre. Aye. Miguel Galarza. Aye. Amanda Gallo. Aye. Alan Guy. Aye. Susan Granzella. Aye. Jacob Lopez. Aye. Diana Love. Aye. Michael Mark. Aye. Stephen Pinelli, approved absence. Jim Ruane. Aye. Johnny Simpson. Aye. Motion passes. And with that, we conclude the legislative regulatory agenda for today. And it is my pleasure to turn the meeting back to Chair Tiger. Thank you very much, Board Member Galarza. That was outstanding and thorough. And also, we are going to take a 15 minute break and reconvene at quarter of four. <laughs> Absolutely, that was a long <laughs>
Those went a little long. Yep, that's okay. Okay, if we can take our seats again. Okay, if I can ask everyone to take your seats, we are at the time we said we would have for the break. Is the WebEx back online? We are online. Okay, outstanding. So we'll resume the meeting today with um, item F, enforcement. And leading us through that section of our meeting is going to be Enforcement Committee Chair Michael Mark. So I will turn it over to Michael. Thank you, Chair Tykert. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Mark. I'm the Enforcement Committee Chair. I would like to begin with an update on the status of the Enforcement Division's strategic objectives established for the 2022-2024 CSLB Strategic Plan, which begins on page 114 of your packet. I will briefly review each item that requires updates since our last meeting, but invite any questions at any time on items that I, that I do not cover or for which anyone has any questions. So starting off on page 114, strategic plan item 2.1 reads as follows. Leverage current enforcement tools to increase licensees and business knowledge by requiring contractors subject to CSLB corrective action to, to take specific courses. An update regarding the bill relating to CSLB authority to require specific administrative or trade specific work was provided during the legislative community, uh, committee update. A strategic item 2.2 read reads as follow. Research the scope of unlicensed practice, evaluate allocated enforcement resources, and meet with industry stakeholders to re review enforcement strategies. This item was summarized during the registrar's update earlier today. And then I will now move on to the next item unless there was questions on strategic item 2.1 and 2.2. And there's no questions here. Is there any public comment? No public comment. Okay, moving on to strategic plan item 2.3. That reads as follows. Coordinate educational workshops with agency partners to assist applicants and licensees in complying with contractor state license law and other business requirements. For this item, an educational workshop is scheduled at CSLB headquarters for September 11th, 2023, and an educational workshop is scheduled for Southern California, September 18th. We have committed from the uh, Chief of Labor Enforcement Ta Task Force for LETF to participate in these workshops. We do need to secure a Southern California meeting site still. And uh, I, I, myself and the registered folk were talking earlier, there could be a couple of sites become available, but if there's any additional ones, please reach out to CSLB. Uh, moving on to strategic item 2.4, that item reads, review and create a structured enforcement training program with enforcement academy to achieve statewide investigation and legal action consistency prior to covid the covid-19 pandemic enforcement regulatory conducted one week enforcement academies i'm pleased to report that two enforcement academies are currently scheduled one for northern and one for the uh, central region as well as another one for the southern regional staff both academies will be conducted by our Deputy Attorney General liaisons, Brent Jex and Christine Lee. The Northern and Central Enforcement Academy will take place July 17th through the 21st in Sacramento at CSLB headquarters. And the Southern Enforcement Academy will take place October 16th through the 20th in Norwalk. 
The Academy will provide an overview, overview of the, the Department of Consumer Affairs and the CSLB's Enforcement Division's organization, the unit functions, the responsibilities, as well as an overview of the Attorney General's Office and administrative processes. Topics to be covered include an introduction to investigations, interview techniques, report writing, safety awareness, phone tactics, specific code training, as well as practical exercises and, and individual assessments. Strategic plan item 2.5, moving on, reads as follows. Research the need to establish a public works enforcement union, unit to perform outreach to awarding agencies and coordinate public works investigations with compliance groups and government in entities to enforce CSLL requirements. An enforcement quality assurance unit was, cre re was recreated in 2022 with four special investigators assigned to the quality assurance unit for, to perform public works investigations as part of their duty statement. And finally, strategic plan item 2.6 reads as follows, continue to enforce workers' compensation insurance requirements to protect consumers and workers and scrutinize licensees who self-certify they have no employees. This effort is ongoing and uh, I will discuss these strategies more in depth during agenda item three tomorrow. Uh, that completes the enforcement division strategic plan items. Are there any comments here in the room? Seeing none, is there any comments from board members online or public members online? No public comment. Okay, moving on. Moving on to agenda item F.2, Enforcement Program Statistical Update. The enforcement program statistical update begins on page 119 of your board packet. Your packet includes uh, thorough information, and I will actually request Enforcement Chief Steve Grove to provide a couple of highlights at this time. Uh, Thank you, Chair Mark. I have two highlights of successful investigations which resulted in recent criminal convictions that I'd like to share with you, beginning on page 119 of your packet. The first case involves unlicensed contractor Adam Soares, who contracted with a consumer in January of 2020 to complete a residential remodel project for over $240,000. Consumer paid more than $220,000 to Soares prior to terminating him when she discovered that all of the subcontractors he hired were unlicensed. A CSLB investigator referred this case to the Stanislaw County District Attorney's Office for multiple misdemeanor and felony charges, including Business and Professions Code Sections 7028, Contracting Without a License, 7159.5A5, Accepting Money Beyond the Value of Work Performed, 7161B, Misrepresentation to Obtain a Contract, and Penal Code Sections 484B, Diversion of Construction Funds, 487, Grand Theft, 532, Theft by False Pretenses, and 506, Embezzlement. On March 20th, 2023, Soares entered a plea of no contest to contracting without a license. He was sentenced to 10 days in jail, one year probation, and ordered to pay $283,000 in restitution to the consumer. The next highlight begins on page 120 of your packet. In 2017, licensed contractor Jonathan Bermudez, sole owner of Futura's Painting, contracted with a consumer to construct an accessory dwelling unit, or ADU, for $350,000. Bermudez requested an unlawful $105,000 down payment. Bermudez was paid over $200,000 before being terminated by the consumer for failing to obtain a building permit and excessive delays toward completing this project. A CSLB industry expert determined that there was no monetary value to the work performed, and it would cost approximately $17,500 just to restore the property to its pre-existing condition. The case was referred to the Alameda County District Attorney's Office 
for multiple misdemeanor and felony charges, including Penal Code Section 368, Elder Abuse, 487, Grand Theft, and 484B, Diversion of Construction Funds. On April 28, 2023, Bermuda's pled guilty to Diversion of Construction Funds and agreed to pay $75,000 in restitution to the consumer due by September 25th, 2023. He was sentenced to one day in jail and given, uh, given credit for time served. And that, in, that concludes my highlights. All right, thank you. Any uh, questions for Steve? Any questions from the public for Steve? No public comment. Okay, um, moving on, thank you. You will, uh, turning back to page 119, uh, you will note some staffing information. Enforcement supervisors and managers continue to prioritize filling vacancies. Currently, there are 21 vacant positions, which is an approximately 10% vacancy rate. Interviews have been conducted and candidates selected uh, for 13 of these vacant positions. Turning to page 121 is complaint statistics. For the period of July 1st, 2022 to April 30th, 2023, more than 14,000 consumer filed complaints have been received or more than 1,300 per month. If you compare the first five months of a calendar, calendar year with the first five months of 2023, you will find that consumer filed complaints average approximately 1100 per month in 2022 and 1300 per month in 2023. Or to put it this, this way, CSLB has received a thousand more consumer complaints during the first five months of 2023 year over year to uh, 2022. With current staffing levels, the optimal maximum enforcement division caseload is 4,635 pending complaints. And as of April 30th, 2023, the pending caseload was 5,363. A major contributor to this increased caseload continues to be the residential solar installation complaints and a small number of contractors that are receiving an excessive number of complaints. Solar complaints are currently averaging over 200 per month. Uh, consumer service representatives, CSRs, and special investigators in the enforcement division are working very hard to keep up with the incoming complaints. The weighted monthly case closing average per special investigator in, in uh, the centers remains steady at nine closures per month, just shy of the closure goal of 10. CS CSRs assigned to two of the CSLB intake mediation centers have exceeded complaint handling expectations by mediating or resolving more than 20 complaints monthly. From July 2022 through April 2023, en enforcement efforts have resulted in more than 25 million in restitution to financially injured parties. Another board, board go goal is to approximately the, uh, they dispose all but 100 complaints within 207 days of receipt. As of April 30th, 2023, 308 complaints exceeded 270 days in age. Enforcement supervisors continue to work closely with their staff and provide guidance during monthly case reviews in an effort to reduce this backlog of age cases. Moving onward to page 122, uh, CLSLB sponsored arbitration and disciplinary action statistics. Uh, let us know if you have any questions about those. So I'm going to, we'll give a, a pause for questions. Any questions so far from board members? See none. Any questions from the public? No public comment. Okay, moving on. And finally, I'll brief you on the proactive enforcement uh, that CSLB is doing, uh, which is conducted by the 27 uh, SWIFT team um, uh, representatives. This information begins on page 124 of your board packets. From July 1st, 2022 to April 30th, 2023, SWIFT conducted 17 undercover sting operations across the state participated in 257 sweep, uh, sweep days and responded to 818 leads. 
uh, by the industry or the public. The investigators closed 2,694 cases as a result of the operations with 741 cases resulting in, in an administrative or criminal legal action. Additionally, over 1,039 advisory notices were issued for relative minor violations. These results are very impressive, but even more so considering that the majority of the investigators assigned to the SWIFT unit have been re redirected from normal enforcement duties. During that time period, they provide assistance to the victims affected by the 2022 winter storms at more than 50 local assistance centers and dis disaster recovery centers across the state. SWIFT is currently collaborating with the National Association of State Contractors Licensing Agencies better known as NASCLA, to perform multi-state proactive enforcement. You, sh you should receive a NASCLA press release regarding these national operations in July. That con concludes the enforcement program statistical update. This is information item only, no motions are needed. But is there any other board comments? See none. Is there any public comment? No public comment. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're going to move the, the final agenda item is F3, which is an update on CSLB solar system restitution program. This begins on uh, page 129 of your board packet and includes statistics through May 31st. The latest stats as of June 13th are there has been 632 claims received. 320 claims approved, $4,047,224 approved for payment with 37 pending claims. This program became operational in January of 2022 with a $5 million general fund allocation, which includes up to $1 million for CSLB administrative costs. Because of the effective implementation and monitoring of this program by CSLB staff, the administrative costs were kept under $400,000, leaving an additional $600,000 to go towards payouts to, to consumers. The average claim payout is $12,581. Ten of these claims referred to CSLB-sponsored arbitration. On January 1st, 2023, CSLB staff had to cut off receiving any new claims as the fund balance was nearing depletion. There are approximately 37 claims in process, which are expected to, to deplete the balance of the fund. Unfortunately, more than 180 additional claims were received, but the victims were notified that unless additional funding is received by CSLB, their claim could not be processed. So as you can see, this has been a very successful program that has benefited hundreds of California consumers who were victimized by unscrupulous solar contractors. I would just like to take a minute and recognize the hard work of our staff from both the enforcement and the executive divisions, some full-time, some part-time who volunteered for this assignment. Additionally, I would like to give a special thank you to the California Solar and Storage Association for their assistance with locating solar and industry experts who assisted with our investigations. CSLB staff continues to discuss potential future solar recovery options with the CPUC, but nothing con concrete has been yet established. The next board chair may want to establish a two-person advisory committee to discuss the potential need for a further solar recovery fund. This concludes enforcement program update. Is there any board comments? Is there any public comments? No public comment. Um, uh, I will just take the... Oh, Susan Grinzella. Uh, I do have a comment, and I think I mentioned this last time when we went into some detail. There has to have been some energy and commitment from some organization, and we can see it was AB 137, to come up with $5 million for solar uh, recipients who have been wronged. And, um, and it's hard to believe that that has completely shut off uh, the discussions of renewing this or doing it again, because it was $5 million, and yet it is the bulk of the complaints we receive. So uh, are there any other ways that we may act as a board to see if that can be reclaimed? Yeah, can I just provide a little background how the fund came about? For, for about four years now, 
we've met regularly with the Public Utility Commission and what's now known as uh, was the Department of Business Oversight DBO, and now the Department of Financial Pro uh, Protection and, Inter and Innovation. I think I got that right. So we have these regular meetings, and the morning we have the state the, the state entities meet, and they're confidential. But in, but the second part of the meeting we would have the public come in. And so what happened is we had a whole lot of public coming in from Central California. We had the mayor of Perlon and early on in Parlier routinely at these meetings. And they had been harmed extremely bad. And they these are a lot of uh, agricultural workers, low-income people. And so it became known that they had been taken advantage of. Uh, at that time, it was a lot of PACE loans. They'd taken out loans for solar projects. Some of them didn't even have. They never even got the solar project. So with Mar Martha Guzman Aceves, is a, was a PUC commissioner at the time, and she was really the champion of getting this fund. And she worked with the Dolores Horta Foundation, and that's that's a foundation in Central California that helps low-income people. And Beth Zedek is down in Southern California, same type of thing. They have attorneys that, that will represent somebody uh, for no charge. And so these groups all got together and realized we needed something uh, to help these consumers who had been targeted for solar that they didn't understand what they were signing up for. You had examples of a home with solar panels over the entire home. You know, somebody, you know, took out a hundred thousand dollar loan for this, thinking he's going to sell this energy back to the power to electricity company. And it doesn't work that way. You know, you get some credit, but he's, they're losing a lot of money. So that's, that is what generated the $5 million. And we had a lot of accusations, a lot of contractors revoked, a lot of cases filed criminally against these contractors. In order to qualify for the fund, you had to have a contractor that we either had revoked the license, was unlicensed, or we were going to be revoking the license soon. We had an accusation that was being proceeded, uh, pursued. So where are we at now? Yeah, what happened with the fund is there's uh, four contractors that left literally a hundred or more, you know, consumers financially harmed. One and one was up to almost like a million dollars when we figured out one contractor alone. So what do we do now? We're working still with the Public Utility Commission. And, you know, with the board's support, I think we need to further that dialogue. We need to see if there's a way to have some type of continuing funding until we have a little better handle on this industry. Because it is unique in construction. I mean, I, I'm gonna, I'll just preface this by saying most solar contractors, they do a great job. They're ethical, no problem. But there are some that what they're doing is they're getting this payment directly from the lenders. They have a business model, and that is to collect the payment and not do the work. And that is a problem still. So now our fund is, is depleted, and we need to look for another funding source. Or there's going to be a lot of financially injured consumers in this, that have been taken advantage of by a solar contractor. But that's a long answer to say we're going to work with the Public Utility Commission, see if we can come up with some strategies. Perhaps the next chair wants to appoint a two-person board member advisory committee. Come back to the board, see if you would support the proposals. Thank you, Dave. And a and, uh, secondary comment, you know, at our, at our last board meeting, you mentioned PACE. We did uh, uh, approve the support uh, I'm not sure assembly bill number, but maybe uh, Jaminski can help out. But throw you out, throw you on out there. Uh, but there was a support for any type of legislation to have a new type of pace type funding loan. Um, and maybe uh, Dave has a comment on that. Yeah. So we we have worked closely with various uh, consumer protection uh, advocacy groups and they were hopeful that there'd be a trailer bill. The initial $5 million was part of the governor's trailer bills, general fund money. And there was some hope that we might receive something similar through this cycle. But uh, the feedback we're receiving is there is a budget deficit now, and it's unlikely that will materialize. Do you hear anything more recent, Mike? No, and we have until July 1st to hear something. I don't know if Fauna is still on the line. She monitors every single trailer bill. Um, she'll pop in if she is. Otherwise, uh, there's nothing to report on those efforts. Mike, uh, I got a quick question. We thought about working with the lenders and holding them accountable for releasing funds to contractors that don't have licenses and haven't done work. Yeah, absolutely. And we've had meetings recently. We've had a number of meetings with PACE providers, with also green lenders. And... 
I will tell you, I don't name any names here, but it's really interesting talking to one of the larger PACE providers where they recognize that they were that they would argue they're duped and that the contractor said they actually had installed the system and that's why they paid for it. But we're, we're telling them, we got examples here where you paid the contractor in full, they don't have a system. And they were making them pay on their property taxes, they can't afford it, they're still paying their property tax bill. And the answer was at this point, one of the they said we don't even have like ten dollars to re return to anybody. We can't help them. Then we had meetings with the grain lenders. We talked to them and said, you know, this is what I'm I'm asking. I'm just asking, don't pay the contractor direct. Pay the homeowner. That way they can control the money. But they don't want to take that approach. That's not their business model. They want to continue to do it. They they tell you that we're going to put in more oversight, we're going to make phone calls, make sure the work's done. So, well, maybe you need to have someone drive out there then and look at it. Because as long as you're paying the contractors directly, you don't see that in other industries. You just don't. But in solar, when you're doing it, and there's a track record of the contractors not completing the jobs, the consumers have nowhere to go, especially with the PACE loans, because they're a priority loan. Now, I, I want to say that the PACE loans were more than 40% or about 50% of our consumer complaints a couple of, uh, two, three years ago. Today, there's a lot less. So DFPI... That's another the other stage I mentioned earlier. They're doing a good job, I think, now of regulating them. But a couple of the PACE providers left California. And I think you heard that was why uh, there's a need for a PACE funding. Because when we talk about our solar recovery fund, we didn't pay out for any bad PACE loans. So I will say this. What we did do is look and see what the contractor received on many of them. And we would pay out the balance as to what the project was worth, saying the contractor got paid $50,000 from a PACE loan, the job's only worth $30,000, the consumer then would be entitled to a payout of $20,000. We did that. But that doesn't mean they don't have a $100,000 PACE loan on their house. Some people have multiple PACE loans on their home, and there's there's really no relief for them today. Uh, I'll add a comment of enforcement as a whole. Uh, in the report, there's a lot of these complaints are from the same industry and, and enforcement as a whole is trying to crack down on that. I, I think at what, what usually happens, unfortunately, there is a couple unscrupulous contractors that are taking advantage of consumers and the, a lot of the complaints are coming from the same contractors. So uh, I know um, Register Folk and uh, Chief Grove, they have a plan of attack going forward. Um, and in the end, we're consumer protection. We're trying to make sure that these particular individuals, and and ideally that we would not need a, a particular team to go out there and looking for them, but it's out there. So uh, I commend uh, enforcement staff for everything that they are doing, and especially when they are actually being taken from their job duties to help the general public in, in emergency cases. That makes it our workload even harder. So. Appreciate that. Uh, with that, that concludes the Enforcement Committee report. Unless there's any public comment. Seeing hearing no public comment, that concludes the report. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Michael. So we will now move on to the Licensing Committee update and I'll turn this over to Licensing Committee Chair Jim Ruane. Thank you, Chair Tykert. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Jim Ruane, the Licensing Committee Chair, and I'm providing the Licensing Division update today. Also, Examination Manager Carol Gagnon is covering for the vacant Licensing Chief. Former Licensing Chief Fod uh, Garagoslu retired June 1st. So our first item is update, review, discussion, and possible action of 2022-2024 Licensing and Testing Strategic Plan Objectives. Let's begin with the Licensing and Testing Objectives on page 133. Item 1.1 is to assess barriers to licensure for women and minorities and create an outreach plan to community colleges and construction management programs, labor unions and workforce development groups to increase licensee diversity and create a better understanding of applicants and licensees. Progress with this project is ongoing with the Public Affairs Office championing the executive division's outreach goals for employee recruitment. You will hear about efforts to encourage women to consider a construction career from Chair Tiger tomorrow. Item 1.2 is to study and appraise existing and prospective reciprocity agreements to determine if they are needed, and if so, whether qualifying criteria for reciprocity agreements need to be updated or codified legislatively. Currently, California has reciprocity agreements with Nevada, Arizona, and Louisiana. Written reciprocity agreements were established between California and Nevada in 2001. 
between California and Arizona in 2004, and between California and Louisiana in 2018. For these agreements, waiver of the trade exam is subject to the following conditions. Number one, the applicant applies for a classification that appears in the reciprocal license classification list. Number two, the applicant has held an active license in good standing in the reciprocal state for no less than five of the previous seven years. And number three, the applicant must submit a verification of licensure from the reciprocal state. Staff is constantly reviewing requests from other states regarding reciprocity and has noticed a big discrepancy between contractors coming to California versus those who leave. Our records show that in 2021 and 2022, we accepted 24 and 27 reciprocity requests from Nevada and Arizona and Louisiana. In contrast, we completed hundreds of license verification forms for other states, such as Florida, which we do not have a reciprocity agreement with. We received 2,150 requests for license verification in 2022 and through May 2023. It is anticipated the two-person board member reciprocity advisory committee comprised of Dave, David De La Torre and Miguel Galarza will meet next month to discuss pending reciprocity requests and how to ensure consumer protection. Carol, would you like to say something? Certainly. In addition to researching reciprocity, we're also expanding our exam administration to two other states. Most of our licensees with out-of-state addresses are located in Nevada, Oregon, and Washington. And so we're going to expand testing for all 47 trades to PSI test centers in Las Vegas, Nevada, where half of you are now, and Wilsonville, Oregon, which is really close to Portland and only three and a half hours south of Seattle. Now, Washington doesn't have a test center that's listed on the master contract for DCA under PSI. Expanding in new test centers, though, is going to reduce travel time for out-of-state licensees or candidates and make it easier for reciprocity candidates to access the law and business exam. So when they apply for reciprocity here, it's going to make it easier for them to take their exam in their home state. That's all I have, Jim, for this. All right. Thank you, Carol. Uh, next is Strategic Plan 1.5 to partner with public affairs to streamline and eliminate jargon on CSLB licensing web pages, handouts, publications, and forms to reduce user confusion and processing times. This is an ongoing effort between public affairs and the licensing division to find inconsistencies or errors on the website and streamline issues like the location or ease of access to documents, such as the license application, and provide clear explanations of complicated licensing processes. Current projects include updating the website to provide clear information about what criminal convictions will and will not preclude licensure, as well as clear up some inconsistencies in guidance for licensees who seek to change their license entity type with the Secretary of State. That completes the licensing division strategic plan items. Uh, do board members have any comments or questions? Are there any comments from the public there in the room? Hey, Jim, this is Mary Tykert. I just want to appreciate and commend the data gathering effort that's gotten started with trying to understand the demographics of our existing licensees, because I think that's a good first step to doing anything that we want to have be different is understanding what we currently have. So I really appreciate that effort. Great. Any comments from uh, the public there in the room? Rico, please check to see if there are any comments from members of the public on WebEx. No public comment. All right. Thank you. Item number two, licensing and testing program update and statistical summary. You can find the licensing update on page 138. I will highlight a few items for the board. Regarding applications, the packet on page 139 indicates the number of applications received. As you can see, the number for the last quarter is greater than the last three quarters. Licensing received over 1,200 more applications in the last quarter than it had averaged in the three quarters before. Also on page 140, you will see the processing time for all application types. Currently, processing times are between three and four weeks. Those numbers increased during the first quarter of 2023 due to vacancies, which resulted from retirements and promotions. The goal is to drop all processing times below three weeks and maintain this level. As of Friday, June 16th, the exam applications processing times are below three weeks. This means that a licensing technician will review the application within three weeks of it arriving at CSLB. I want to acknowledge staff's hard work for reducing processing times in pulling records over the last nine years. Examination application processing times have only hit three weeks twice. The average over those years is closer to five weeks. Staff did a great job on this. Thank you very much. 
I would like to invite testing manager Carol uh, Gagnon again to comment about the decrease in pending applications by fiscal year 2021-2022 on page 141. Carol? Sorry, video problems. <laughs> so the de decrease is due to two factors. First of all, finally, COVID restrictions have been listed, and so the test centers are able to test at full capacity. In addition, because we're at PSI, they can test in the evenings. They test six days a week, so candidates have a lot more choices of when to take their exams. Second, staffing levels have finally gone back up again and increased, and so licensing is able to speed up the processing of the applications because we have more people who are there and fully trained and able to work on it. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Please note the total renewals received table at the bottom of page 142. The calendar year total renewals for 2022 shows 117,694 received, which reflects an approximate 6% decline for the last two calendar years. These statistics are compared between calendar years, whereas the budget update statistics from page 46 of the packet are by fiscal year. In either case, renewals seem to be down, but generally the active license population reflecting total renewed licenses appears stable for now. And this is a subject that staff are consistently monitoring. And I know uh, Board Member Guy had some concerns with this a little earlier. Regarding workers' compensation stats on page 143-44, as of January 1st, 2023, per Senate Bill 216, the following classifications now require workers' compensation insurance. C8 concrete, C20 warm air heating, ventilating, and air conditioning, D49 tree service, and C22 asbestos abatement. As a result of this change, staff noticed an increase in classification removal requests for these classifications. In total, among the four classifications, there are 584 less licensees between January and June of 2023, with the biggest impact seen in the C20 classification by a decline of 239. On page 146, you will note an update regarding CSLB's License Application Experience Verification Program. As of last summer, the licensing division referred most of the experience investigations to the Enforcement Division. In the first quarter of 2023, investigators closed over 30 cases per month. You can find the testing update on page 151. CSLB completed transitioning to PSI exams on July 1st, 2022. And as of May 25th, 2023, PSI exams has administered 37,638 exams, and there are 4,790 exams scheduled. Currently, there are no backup in testing, backlogs in testing. Applicants can take their test at 20 PSI centers in California. PSI offers after hours and weekend scheduling as well. And finally, the exam development unit has held numerous workshops to continue occupational analyses and examination development work to update existing exams. That concludes the licensing and testing update. Uh, Carol is available if the board has any questions. Do board members have any comments? All right, are there any comments from the public there in the room? Enrico, any comments from members of the public on WebEx? No public comment. All right, thank you. Our last item is Test Administration Center's Outsourcing Update. On page 151, you can find information about the Test Administration Center's. CSLB has moved 47 written examinations to PSI. Overall, the process is running smoothly. In order to remove barriers to licensure, CSLB has worked with the vendor to translate 47 study guides to Spanish and have them available on CSLB's website. We're also in process of translating the law and business exam into Spanish, and we'll have it available by August 2023. And Carol, would you uh, provide a little update on this item? Yes. The law and business exam is going to be in the test centers in Spanish in on August 1st in about, gosh, six weeks. So that will be coming. In addition, nine more exams are going to follow by the end of the year. These 10 exams are those that have received the most requests for a translator in Spanish in the last five years. The exam administration manager did a lot of research on this, and he estimates that 95% of our requests for a translator in the last 20 years have been for Spanish, and these 10 exams represent about 80% of those requests. He also estimates that administering these exams in Spanish instead of people having to do a translator is going to save CSLB about $60,000 a year because we won't have to pay for a private room for the translation and we won't have to pay 
for a private proctor to supervise their exams. So getting these exams moved over is going to save us money too. It's also going to speed up processing time for these candidates because then they don't have to wait for their translator to get approved. They can just go in and take their exam on a regular day with everybody else and they're just going to see it in Spanish instead of in English because that's what they're going to select. Now for other trade exams that are not being translated yet, those they will still have to get a translator for and go through the regular process, but their law and business they will get to take in the written form as a Spanish exam. That's all of my update for this. Thank you, Carol. Uh, making some great progress on that. Uh, thank you. And before I move on, do board members have any questions or comments? Any comments from the public there in the room? Rico, anything on WebEx from members of the public? No public comment. Thank you all. Uh, this concludes the licensing items on the agenda. Uh, back to you, Chair Tiger. Thank you. Thank you, Jim and Carol. <clears throat> so the last item on today's agenda is public affairs, and I'll now turn it over to Public Affairs Committee Chair Alan Guy. Thank you, Chair Tiger. Catherine, I think you're up first. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I'll be providing an update. Oh, yes, um, I'll be providing an update on the strategic plan progress made by um, the public affairs office team. Um, on page 158, um, we will begin with strategic plan item 4.1, which focuses on expanding CSLB's online presence to educate both consumers and the industry. The public affairs office is committed to this ongoing object objective, researching the best ways to deliver CSLB's messages to the industry while also reaching out to underserved communities through targeted outreach efforts. Moving on to strategic plan item 4.2, we have made notable strides in establishing a CSLB specific new board member orientation. Building upon the extension approved at the March 2023 meeting, the Public Affairs Office has been working on updating the board member orientation materials. Our new, our new staff members have been developing narrative overviews that cover legislative processes, licensing and testing functions, and enforcement procedures. These overviews will soon be included in the welcome binder provided to the new board members. Additionally, they will serve as the foundation for an engaging orientation video, offering board members a convenient and informative resource. Strategic Plan Item 4.3 focuses on enhancing the user experience through website content updates, improved accessibility, and navigation. Public Affairs Office is dedicated to this immediate and ongoing and ta task. In line with our commitment to inclusivity, we are planning a meeting with consumer groups in August to gather valuable input, ensuring our website caters to the specific needs of consumers and the construction industry. Continuing our dedication to education and support, Strategic Plan Item 4.4 emphasizes the development of video tutorials. These tutorials are designed to produce errors for consumers, licensees, and applicants by providing clear instructions on various processes, such as completing forms. The Public Affairs Office continues to create new and informative videos on common errors and emerging topics. Finally, let's highlight Strategic Plan Item 4.5, which involves establishing communication channels with C20 and C38 contractors aligned with Governor Newsom's carbon reduction goals. Public Affairs Office has issued industry bulletins on related matters, and CSLB will coordinate with Board Member Michael Mark in scheduling an industry meeting for October. In conclusion, the Public Affairs Office remains focused in its efforts to achieve the objectives outlined in our strategic plan. Please let me know if you have any questions. I will now turn the table back over to Alan Guy. Thank you, Catherine. Since this is an informational item only, no action is required of the board. Do any board members in the room have a comment? Any board members online have a comment? Any public comments in the room or online? No public comments online. Chair Tyker, that concludes the public affairs strategic plan update. I think it's right back to me. And uh, would you, may I turn it back to you for a program update? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Thank you Chair Tiger. <laughs> I am pleased to bring you the public affairs update today, starting on page 161. The Public Affairs Office, or PAO, is responsible for media, industry, licensee, and consumer communications, as well as outreach. They provide proactive public relations, respond to media inquiries, and develop and distribute publications and newsletters. They also conduct education and outreach for consumers and contractors. PAO creates content for the CSLB's social media channels and website, including webcasts and videos. They conduct workshops and seminars for disaster survivors and contractors, and present speeches to service groups and organizations. 
Disaster response has been a key effort over the past year. CSLB works to educate property and business owners so they are not harmed by unlicensed or unscrupulous contractors after a disaster. In the latter half of 2022 and early 2023, CSLB staff staffed and participated in 43 disaster recovery centers throughout California. A list of those DRCs is provided in the board packet. Starting at the bottom of page 163, you can see that PAO's outreach efforts have been vast, including contact with legislator offices, building departments, and construction industry associations. This communication is for disaster survivors looking to rebuild and contractors who plan to work in the disaster area. The Public Affairs Office also participates in a multi-agency task force established by the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services, Cal OES. In the area of video and digital services, PAO is focused on creating informative videos for consumers, licensees, and applicants. These videos cover topics such as online license renewal, hiring contractors for seniors, contractor advertising guidelines, and celebrating Women in Construction Week. The videos are shared on social media platforms and archived on the CSLB website. PAO has also prioritized translating and producing Spanish language consumer and licensee tips videos. You can see a list of live and recorded videos starting on page 165. On page 166, you can see how PAO's efforts have grown CSLB, CSLB's following on social media by improving engagement with applicants, licensees, the news media, and other stakeholders. CSLB maintains an active presence on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, where collectively its following has grown by 7%. On YouTube, PAO produced 29 videos, and CSLB's video library on the platform earned nearly 75,000 views over the past year. Page 167 demonstrate, demonstrates the outreach of CSLB's social media efforts, where its Facebook posts reached more than 52,000. Another 40,000 Californians were reached via CSLB's Instagram and Twitter efforts. On page 170, you can see that PAO has grown CSLB's email subscriber database to more than 75,000 people. Those are stakeholders who have requested to receive information such as meeting notices, consumer alerts, and industry bulletins. In fact, CSLB issued 11 industry bulletins between July 1 and April 30th, which were also sent to those who subscribe. Starting on page 171, the public affairs media relations efforts are highlighted. PAO responded to 37 inquiries and issued 17 news releases between July 1 and April 30. The media coverage has focused on various topics, including disaster-related reminders, sting operation results, solar scams, and legal actions against unlicensed contractors. The following page provides information on consumer and community outreach efforts. PAO hired an outreach coordinator a few months ago, and that is allowing CSLB to attend more in-person senior scam stopper seminars around the state. PAO continues to host to also host virtual seminars. On page 174, PAO's publication and graphic design services are highlighted. PAO's graphic design unit has completed several publications and reports, including the release of, a, of the 2023 California Contractor License Law and reference book and fast facts related to disaster response. A full list can be found on that page. The Public Affairs Office also writes and publishes content for internal communications. PAO has published 16 employee internet articles highlighting employee and organizational accomplishments and providing access to forms, policies, reports, and other important information for CSLB staff. The internet, the intranet, is accessible to all CSLB employees around the state, and it is the first thing they see when they open up their web browser on their work computers. Moving on to page 176, CSLB's Public Information Center, under the Public Affairs Office, has experienced varying wait times due to supervisor turnover and staff absences. However, improvements have been observed since May and into June, and staff expects continued improvement with the upcoming recruitment of additional staff. Since this is an informational item only, no action is required of the board. Do any board members in the room have a comment? Do any board members online have a comment? Do we have any public comment here in the room or online? No public comment. 
Thank you, Chair Tiger. That concludes the public affairs program update. Thank you, Board Member Guy, and thank you, Ms. White. Uh, this concludes our board business for today. May I get a motion to adjourn the board meeting? Sure. So moved. Second? Second. All right, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. What? Do we want to change stuff tomorrow or just try and drive specifically the comments?